Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to call this special meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order, Monday, November 21st, 2022. Thank you all for joining us here. Plenty of staff here to present, and I know we've got plenty of folks online tuning in. We have uh, a total of four items officially on the agenda under organizational business. We have our 2023 budget discussion under Community Development Department, uh, their budget and revenue and, fund dis and fee discussion. Item 2.2 is our 2023 budget discussion, Community Services Department budget, Park and Rec Department budget, Finance Department budget, Administration Department budget. And then finally on 2.3, an overall discussion on our 2023 budget and tax levy. And item 2.4, as we typically do, will be our city's manager and council updates. So that is our agenda for this evening. I don't think officially we need to adopt the agenda, do we? Never a bad idea. Never a bad idea. Let's adopt the agenda. Uh, I will move approval of the agenda unless there's anything to add. Council? Second. Motion and a second to uh, adopt tonight's agenda. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Uh, would like to point out that Councilmember D'Alessandro is participating electronically electronically in the lobby of the Holiday Inn Express at 16, 165 Town Run Lane in Stevens City, Virginia. And this location is open and accessible to the public. Thanks for making the effort, Councilmember. Glad you could be part of our discussion tonight. Thank you for having me. Item 2.1 on our agenda uh, kicks off our budget discussion. Uh, this is our community development budget and revenue and fee discussion. Ms. Kari Carlson will be leading us through the bulk of our discussion this evening. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you. So there are seven different presentations this evening, and the first one we're going to start off with is a revenues and uh, fees discussion. So I will go through that, and that's overall um, revenues and fees. And then um, after that, we'll get into the community development presentation with our community development director, Carla Henderson, here. And then we'll just continue on to the other department budget presentations that we were not able to finish um, earlier so, since some, some of the council meetings went longer. So, um, And then at the end, the last presentation will be an overall um, just presentation discussion about the final 2023 budget and tax levy. So if we can pull up the revenue and fees discussion. I'll get I'll go through this. And I'm going to be going through just current revenues in the general fund um, that are in the prelim preliminary general fund budget and talk about lodging and admission taxes as well as permit revenues, the fee schedule, parks and recreation fees, and then some future considerations for potential new revenues. So this is a slide of the preliminary general fund um, budget, just the revenues. And so just wanna point out here the different categories. Um, property taxes are the largest at uh, 69%. And then the second one, lodging and emission taxes um, is the second highest. And so you can see on the list there um, that not all of the general fund revenues are property taxes. We do have uh, other categories as well. And just some broader categories of the different revenue sources for the general fund. So um, the lodging tax that's collected from um, hotels, customers that are at hotels, admission tax from entertainment venues in Bloomington. The building permits um, is another large um, revenue source in the general fund that is, goes along with development and expansion. And there is a fee nexus for the city services provided that go with that uh, building permits. Inspections, um, also in community development. Business licensing um, in the city clerk's office. Program income, a lot of that is in parks and recreation. And then the intergovernmental revenue, which would be mainly the grants. So federal, state, county, local grants. So I um, have some good news about lodging and emission taxes to share next. Um, so as you're aware, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've had a team, um, in the beginning of the pandemic, we're meeting weekly 
from the Port Authority and assessing and finance and just closely monitoring and analyzing the lodging revenues, especially and emissions. And um, as I just said, they are the second largest source of revenue in the city's general fund. So during the pandemic, um, those really dropped off considerably and um, caused a huge strain on the city's finances. Um, in recent months, this trend is looking considerably better for the lodging and emission tax forecast. So um, just based on the analysis and the metrics and trends, uh, we did increase our forecast for 2023 from the preliminary budget that was approved by council in September by 308,000, a little over that. So um, that is an, an increase in revenues, so that helps overall budget. So right now the, um, the occupancy rates um, have been going up and um, I've got August and September data there on the slide. And for 23, we're forecasting that the rates would be at 92% of where the 2019 revenues were. So not back to 100%, but getting much closer. And uh, we're still more conservative than the HVS, the Hotel Valuation Services Study that kind of uses a benchmark along with a lot of other things, but higher than what we forecasted back in September. And then this is that graph that we continue to share. So showing 2019 um, revenues, or this is this um, is the average daily rate for hotel rooms. So 2019 is the blue. You can see that 2020 was a red that's way down there. And then green, 2021 coming back up. And then you can see 2022, um, there are even some times where it went above 2019. Um, Permit revenue. Uh, we also have some good news to report. Um, we are increasing our revenue for permit revenue in the 2023 forecast by $836,000. And you can see on the slide the different categories that make that up. So the biggest one is the building permits, but we also have increases in electrical, HVAC, plumbing, and so on, uh, plan check. So with the um, updated revenue forecast um, and the volume that is coming and what's anticipated for 2023, uh, these are the um, updated numbers. So and just to point out too, even with these increases for the 2023 budget, um, they're still below where we are already year to date for 2022. So that's doing very well in 2022 as well. This is just a quick um, reminder that next week, the public hearing for the fee schedule, November 28th, um, that's been advertised. So currently the proposed fee schedule for 2023 is um, on the city's website. And on there are parks and recreation fees. So um, the recreation fees, fund budgets that will be going over tonight, um, those are based on the, the, the proposed fee schedule for 2023 that's going to be at the November 28th City Council meeting. And so those fees were already reviewed by the Parks, Art, and Recreation Commission back on November 9th. And so staff presented those fees, which um, I'm gonna be presenting tonight, and they are here as well for questions. Um, and just, I'm gonna provide a lot of the same information they provided to the Park uh, Commission. Um, just providing some comparable fee information and discussing some of the significant changes and trends. So this is recreation, um, significant changes and trends. So the increase um, in the budgets and in the fee schedule is the rate for the general park permit fee increasing by $5. Um, pickleball court rates, 75 cents. Adding a rate for recognized Bloomington youth athletic organizations for outdoor skating rinks at 50% of the standard cost. Increase for the summer adventure playgrounds, 20%, 13% for Camp Coda. And then modifying the season pass fees at the Bloomington Family Aquatic Center to encourage early purchasing. So $4 increase to adult passes and $8 for young adults. And here is a comparison, um, some other programs around the metro. So you can see the Camp Coda, Coda Kids, Summer Adventure Playgrounds, the 2022 20, rates, 
and then comparing that to some programs in St. Louis Park, Three Rivers, Egan, and the school district. And then the Family Aquatic Center, these are the comparable fees, so Bloomington's there on the top, comparing that to Richfield, Edina, St. Louis Park, Egan, and Apple Valley. So um, some of the um, some of the other cities do not offer rates based on age, but instead offer discounts for additional passes. So like Richfield and Edina, they have uh, reduced rates for additional passes. And then the note at the bottom that there are reduced cost passes are available to those that are eligible for free and reduced lunch programs through the school district. Significant changes and trends in the ice garden. Um, we remain uh, market rate competitive, but are increasing ice rental rates. Um, there are escalating expenses as throughout the budgets, but um, driven by inflation, utilities is a big expense for the ice garden and staffing. And they're continuing to you know look for ways to fund the the renovation for the Bloomington Ice Garden. So looking um, at local option sales tax as an option. And then also what's new at BIG is concessions are now operated by the city. So it's one of the busiest rinks in the metro. More than 10,000 10, hours were scheduled of ice time in 2022. And um, a five per, there was a 5% rate increase in 2020 and 21, and there's a 3% proposed for 22. And the average for surveyed rinks is $240. So that's up from last year. You can see Bloomington compared to Edina, uh, Blaine, Apple Valley, Egan, Eden Prairie, and so forth. Um, Center for the Arts. So if artistry um, closes, it could obviously impact the 2023 budget. Um, the current budget that we we're gonna show tonight is um, shown with artistry op open since we don't know anything otherwise right now. So that's how we, um, plan the budget and have it tonight. Um, there are strategies in place to increase partnerships with local guest artists groups and um, arts and culture organizations for rentals, educational opportunities, performances. And there's long-term rental conversations happening to increase the frequency and the diversity of arts programs at the Bloomington Center for the Arts. So cost recovery goals are going to remain just status quo um, while they're building pro programs. And um, strategic partnerships for arts education, gallery management, performances, that's all being explored. So um, the art center fees are market rate. There's no facility rental fee increases for 23. And the city facility use fee is going to remain at $2.50 per ticket. And here's some comparable fees for the Bloomington Center for the Arts compared to Hopkins, um, the Masonic Heritage Center in Bloomington, and the AIM Center in Burnsville. Uh, Creekside, um, no rental fees inc increase are proposed for 23. Um, as you know, it's an aging facility. Um, the current rental fees are equal to or slightly higher than other area senior centers. And rentals were slow to return in 21 um, in the beginning of 22, but rentals are continuing to increase. And also, um, it's continuing to attract members of the BIPOC community to rent the facility for family and celebrations and cultural events. And then here's some comparisons again. This is with Edina, Richfield, Eden Prairie. Um, so you can see those comparable fees as well. And then uh, Dwan. Um, Dwan's had some good years. Um, the over 50,000 rounds in 21. Um, oh, they're over the five-year average. And the gross revenue exceeded um, 21 due to a fee increase and increased food and beverage merchandise sales. There are, however, significant staffing challenges. So an increase of 25% in the seasonal wages in the golf budget you'll see is proposed to order to retain and attract employees. And then um, expense increases in all the areas of operation will cause an increase in the fees and products and services in 23. But um, guests are having a very positive experience. And then this is the comparable fee chart for Dwan and uh, nearby golf courses. 
so you can see um, you can see at the top is the current 2022 rate and then right below that is the proposed 23 rate so it's a three dollar green fee increase two dollar cart fee increase proposed So before I go on to just um, a few slides about future considerations, potential new revenues, are there any questions um, for any of the parks and recreation fees? Council, any questions on what we've gone through thus far? Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just have a clarifying question on the pool rate increase. So you said that uh, the rate change would help encourage earlier purchasing. So I'm curious if the increase is going to be the initial price and then there will also be another increase or is it going to be the previous price and then there will be an increase later on? Mayor, council members, for the aquatic center, um, in your fee schedule, we are increasing the standard rate. So when you buy it, when the pool opens, buy $4 and $8. But the change in encouraging the early purchasing is right now or this past year, we gave them $2 off if they purchased before April and $1 off if they purchased before the beginning of the season. This will instead be I want to say $8 off if they purchase by April and $4 off if they purchase by June. You now can purchase them online, so it really gives us a chance to decrease the weight when we open at the pool and encouraging them to purchase them in advance. Great. And then will they still have the, or will we still have the um, half price passes? Halfway, half pay. Okay. Yep. Got Sorry. it. Excuse me. Okay, I think that was my only clarifying question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions, Council? Member D'Alessandro, anything? Let me know. Raise a flag if you need to. Send up I a will, flare. I will. Thank you. Send up a flare. Thank you. All right. <laughs> will do. Onward. So, um, just some potential new revenues that staff has been discussing, um, just with some guidance from City Council. So, one of the things that have come up is corporate sponsorship or naming rights. So just some things to point out with that. Um, we cannot use that for facilities that have any kind of outstanding tax exempt bonds. And currently we don't have the staff available to actively market that to corporations. Um, there's also, it could be limited to a certain types of corporations. Um, so those are just things to keep in mind with that. And then um, additional grant revenues is always um, something that we're looking at for additional funding for projects, but some of the things with additional grant revenues to keep in mind is um, that we have the staff capacity to take on maybe a new program that we're going to be doing with the additional grant funds that we can, that we are, have the ability to carry it out. And that if we're receiving grant revenue for just a few years, um, that it can create a structural structural imbalance in the budget in that at some point those revenues will stop being grants and they'll need to come from another source. So it's something, um, you know, we're aware of that. For example, with the SAFER grant, that's going to end in three years. So we need to have a plan of um, transitioning that over to other sources of revenue, but um, just to keep that in mind as well. Which I appreciate and obviously agree with that we don't want to create the structural imbalance. Wondering if there are grant opportunities as they relate to more capital projects, one-time expenditures to fix up A, B, or C as opposed to putting a program in place that eventually the, the funding runs out for. Yes, a mayor and council members, that is definitely something that we are always looking for, for grant revenues to fund a one-time um, projects like capital projects, um, and then making sure we do have the staff to carry that out as well. Thank you. Councilmember Lohman. Well, Mayor, I agree with you on that. The, the capital expenses make a lot of sense. The other question I had as I looked at the, uh, the corporate sponsorship piece is uh, uh, sometimes, you know, either those, those corporations unfortunately go out of business or uh, they um, uh, participate in some things that uh, may not align with our values uh, that we have. And so I'm just curious, um, has staff thought about that in terms of how do you do, you know, unwind that or get out of that if you're uh, not doing a capital expense thing and you're doing it on an ongoing kind of basis um, and you want to kind of back out of a situation where you've got a corporate sponsor and then 
you know, they're not aligning with some of our, uh, maybe let's say our equity uh, uh, stance. Um, Mayor, city council members, city uh, council member Lohman, um, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to speak to this, but I don't know that we've, do we've dug very deeply into this. I think we're just looking into the subject and see, these are some of the first things that came up, but that would be another thing to consider as well if that was something that we wanted to look at. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm certainly think anytime we can defer um, uh, tax dollars is great, but just want to make sure we have a uh, some kind of way to get ourselves I'm, out of that. I'm, I'm confident. I mean, there's there's structures in place. I'm sure the League of Cities has something on corporate sponsorships or the National League of Cities. Somebody somebody could guide us in terms of that. And if we ended up in a in a difficult situation, I'm sure there'd be written in such a way that we can get out. But I also want to point out, Council Member, we don't have any of these yet. So it's <laughs> so no, I know that. I just I I'm just saying I'd like to just you know be proactive rather than wait until we get into a situation and then. Then you say, well, wait a minute, we have no way of getting out of it. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, <laughs> you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, but uh, you know, we've got the opportunity now. I want to do this. I think it's a good idea. Um, that's, you know, just one of the things I think we should be thinking about as we go through it. Understood. Councilmember Nelson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I just want to clarify, is the corporate sponsorship um, and the tax-exempt bonds limitation limited to naming rights, or does it apply to other advertising sources? And I also believe we already do have this with Toro um, over at Valley View. So um, I just want to understand the limitations of that. Can we put ads up along the boards at a hockey rink in the outfield of a softball or baseball field um, or wherever else we might see the need? And I agree, Council Member, and, and you're right. I think on outfield fences, on dasher boards, in, in the ice rink, and so on, we, we're, we're already in this world in mm -hmm. some ways. But uh, Ms. Mandershan, maybe you could shed a few more light, a little bit more light on this. Sure, uh, Mayor, members. Uh, the 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 reason that the language is in there is that uh, under the law, there are limits on how much income you can take in when you're using tax exempt bonds, and I believe it's 10 percent. Yep, 10%. Uh, so um, we have to pay really close attention to that and um, be mindful of it so that we don't risk the tax exempt status of the bonds. Just a quick follow up 10% of what? Bond principal. Bond principal. Uh, interesting. So that would be a declining amount. Well done, legislature. <laughs> <laughs> Council, any, uh, Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I guess just uh, a note on the sponsorship piece, because I was mentioned um, putting banners up on like the baseball fences or whatever. I do know some of the community organizations do that as a fundraising effort. Um, and so I guess I would just say if we are going to move forward with this and if like I think about our, our sports or our athletic venues, um, if that's in consideration, I would just be cognizant and consider the impact on other organizations too. Thank you, Council Member. Anything additional, Council? Please continue, thank you. So I have a few more. Um, something else to consider would be additional cell towers on city land. Um, selling city-owned land, at what we were just talking about, advertising from corporations on city facilities, maybe even electronic signs. And then um, another one is passport revenues, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the administration um, department's budget presentation, but we could increase um, appointments, but we would, in, we would need additional staff to increase passport revenues. And then I just had one other short thing was just to point out um, that there are federal and state regulations with our fees. Um, and then just this was from Minnesota state statute that fees commiserate with service. So fees established by the municipality must be by legal means and must be fair, reasonable, and proportionate to the actual cost of the service for which the fee is imposed. So we'll keep that in mind as well as we're looking at fees. So that, that's all I had for just um, update on revenues. To, 
two big takeaways from this is the increase in the lodging and admission tax that you'll see at the end um, when we look at the overall budget and the permit revenues. And then also as we're going through all of the parks and recreation budgets, um, those fees are in there. Thank you for the clarification. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so for the, going back to the last slide, <clears throat> advertising on city signs, I actually had a note to myself similar to what Councilmember Lohman said, just wanting to make sure that before we would move forward with something like that, we'd have criteria laid out for the types of organizations that can and cannot um, advertise on city facilities. And so just want to put that out there as a consideration. And then a question, I guess, for the cell towers on city land, does it have to be in a specific zoning district? Yeah. Looking at Mr. Market Guard back there. Yeah, it does. Okay, so it couldn't, we couldn't, there would be limitations then. Okay, thank you. Yes. Council, anything else on revenues? Very good, thank you. Moving on. All right, so now I'm gonna turn it over to Carla. Um, we're gonna bring up the next presentation that's the community development um, budget request. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and council members. We have a quick presentation. So we have a quick department overview. Um, we've talked a lot this year about our HRA and our port, so um, we will not be discussing that this evening. We will be focused on our general fund activities. This is our department request. You can see it's an increase of about $659,000. Most of that is in salaries and benefits, and IT and internal fleet expenses, which we're always told by our budget friends, we can't touch. Um, it is what it is, so um, that's where the majority of the increase that we're requesting comes from. I will start with assessing. So right now, um, assessing fully staff is 12 full-time employees. We are posting for um, Mike Reichel's, Mark Reichel's position uh, hopefully this week and um, that, that they will be fully staffed and we're very excited about that with Tim Bulger, our new city assessor. Uh, as you can see, here's just a bullet of kind of their activities. Mainly uh, they assess the city land to be valued at 17 billion. Dollars, um, I think that's a record for us. And they also inspect 20% of the properties annually. So every five years, they have the assessing team has gone out and physically looked at a property. So um, you can see that. And so here they are. This is what they reviewed, particularly in our residential properties in 2022. Uh, we've had a lot of change in assessing, um, and with that comes a lot of new opportunity. Uh, we're very fortunate that Tim has joined our team and is actually looking at all of the technology that we have um, acquired and how we do things a little bit differently. There, um, He's brought up uh, perhaps we're not maximizing the use of our technology in a way we could, so um, it's always great to have a new set of fresh eyes on our processes as staff has retired um, we've lost some of that institutional knowledge but this has been really really great to have now we'll go to building and inspections so you can see 22 full-time employees we are fully staffed in buildings um, as kari mentioned uh, our revenue has really really significantly increased uh, and you'll see in the development pipeline and planning why that is and continues to be. Uh, but basically here are the activities that we perform. Uh, we have the State Department of Labor and Industry delegated, so plan review and our permits, 
Uh, Council last year talked a lot about time and sale inspections, so that's going on. Um, and we do commercial and residential code enforcement. And then the Met Council delegated activities regarding our SAC charges. And so here is a snapshot of what we had budget, what we actually raised last year in 2021, and where we are year to date, and that was mid October. Um, so doing extremely well in our revenue with all the activity happening. And now we'll go to environmental health. Uh, we have 17 full-time employees. I think we have an office support specialist position um, vacancy due to Hillary Benson getting promoted. Um, and so once we get that post, it is posted internally, so we hope to have that filled, we'll be fully staffed. And so here is um, the state MDH and MDA delegation. Uh, we also do work in Richfield for their food, pool, and lodging, rental housing inspections, and then, of course, commercial and residential code enforcement, which many members sitting up there uh, receive emails from our residents talking about that. And here is the program revenue. As you can see, in 2021, uh, we brought in a little over $1.3 million, and then year-to-date, in mid-October, we're approaching 1.1 million. Next, we'll go to planning. Planning this year had a lot of uh, turnover due to some retirement, a uh, retirement and a, a resignation. Uh, we have the last, hopefully, planner position just closed for um, to work on our housing. The, that position is split between planning and the HRA. So we're hopefully going to have that fully staffed. And here's a list of the activities that planning does for the city and also working with our planning commission. This is development uh, review, which is a bulk of what we <laughs> work on in planning. And as you can see, this is a snapshot of non-residential projects and our residential projects in the pipeline. And that was as of September of this year, uh, which is why we expect our permit revenue to continue to be strong because we have so much development in the pipeline. And then here's a list of all the long range planning that our planning staff takes under that they did in 2022. Um, and they come up with their work plan every year, as you know, um, and take on lots and lots of topics. And I love that Glenn added this because I think he wanted to show that they do bring in revenue. Um, <laughs> they uh, negotiate all the wireless uh, leasing. So kudos to Glenn and his team for bringing in $760,000. And then the last kind of division in community development is administration. We are a team of three, myself, Hillary Benson, who just got promoted, We're very happy about that, and Barb Wolf, who I call our secret weapon. And she is our manager of special projects and initiatives. And she has really been leading a lot of our work with our small business community. And um, it's just been wonderful to see that area grow in community development. She also researches a ton of funding opportunities and has been responsible for, I would say, the majority of the grants that we've received in community development, including the money that we have for our small business resource center, which is a capital project. Um, so we've raised one and a half million dollars for that project so far. So very excited about that. And that is the end of community development it's a presentation for the general fund. Thank you for the presentation. Quick question under environmental health, the Richfield contract, I'm assuming simply is a contract that pays for the services that we provide to Richfield. It's not a moneymaker. It's just, we're simply paying for the work that we do. That is correct, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, that is correct. Thank you. Council Member Lohman. 
I just wanted to, to accolades uh, for the assessing uh, department. I was uh, just recently down in Kansas City, and uh, uh, they were speaking some praise of him at, as one of the vendors was talking about how he understands this technology. And they showed me some stuff, and I'm very excited to uh, see how that's going to play with uh, GIS and uh and that, so I'm real interested to see how that works. So uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to just ask is, um, and I know this is kind of an unfair question, so you can you know, choose to pass if you want, um, but oftentimes I, I, get, I get asked um, when I'm going door to door, you know, we look at the number of staff, you kind of mention how many staff we have. Um, I don't necessarily want to go through each one, but if we compare that to other uh, cities, how is, is, how is that comparable? Um, you know, is that a bad thing to do in the sense of, you know, we, we have, you know, you, you mentioned the secret weapon back there, which I agree with you on that, that we have some talents and stuff that are there that, that uh, allow us to provide additional services uh, for, for what, we, what we pay for. So uh, I leave it to you what you want to respond to or not respond to with that. Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman. I'll give you an example of... Um, our assessing team and our commercial appraisers, uh, we have four. Is that correct? correct? Yeah. And that's uncommon for most cities, but we have such a robust commercial um, activity that it definitely pays for itself and the value that we place on the relationships that we have with property owners. So we don't just go and, you know, assess the property, but we have a relationship and that obviously takes time, and that's why we have a record amount um, of $17 billion being assessed because we take our time and do our due diligence working with these property owners as well. So does that somewhat answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, cause it's one of the things that, you know, <laughs> having the opportunity to go to a number of these conferences, you learn a number of things, and they teach you a number of things. They, they tell you and warn you about that in terms of trying to make those comparisons where you look at, you know, the amount of staff that somebody has, you know, it's government waste and that type of thing. But, they're, you know, each of our cities are unique and are different, and we need to staff them, and we need to support that long-term investment. And if that's a record year at $17 billion, that's an incredible uh uh, you know, testament to what our staff has been able to do, and uh, just want to caution residents as they as they look at this uh, at what we're trying to do in terms of what we're trying to create and how much is important for us to have the right staff uh, here in Bloomington. So I thank you for that. Thank you. I think the short answer, council members, is that uh, as you know, every city is different, and certainly we're different than cities down in the southern part of the, in the country, obviously, but we're also different than other suburbs. Other suburbs don't have the Mall of America. Uh, other suburbs don't have um, 90,000 people. You know, so it, it's very difficult to, to, to go whether it's per capita or just total numbers or how it all works out. Um, every circumstance is different and I think our, our staffing reflects the, uh, the goals and the priorities and the values that we have as a city and it always has and I think it, it shows in the work that we do and, and the outcomes that we do have. That was a longer answer than a short answer, but the short answer is, the short answer is everything. Every city is different. Appreciate that, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick follow up to that. I mean, I think it's important for people to recognize that it doesn't change our revenue model as a city, the valuation, but it shows that the private sector, both residential, commercial, industrial, retail, whatever it is, is willing to invest in Bloomington and wanting to be here in Bloomington, that our value is going up. Um, but our levy doesn't change because that value goes up, because I think that's a question a lot of people have. Oh, you're just assessing us more so you can get more money. We don't get any more money just by changing your assessment. We try to accur accurately define what that is based on market factors, and people are investing in Bloomington because it's a great place to be. Um, beyond that, um, so one of the concerns I have, environmental health, um, I receive – a uh, number of complaints about ordinance violations that fall into or, uh, environmental health, and they're very, very tough to resolve. And um, I'm just wondering if we don't have the right tools to do those, like to just repeat things that come up, you know, people running automotive repair in their driveway and leaving parts out, um, you know, running home-based businesses that may or may not be allowed, things of that nature. And one of my concerns is we're doing all these inspections telling people you can't do that. And we have, we have some people that just flat out ignore us and they ignore the staff. And 
you know, it's irritating. And it, it candidly, it puts staff in a bad light. It puts us in a bad light. And, um, you know, I'm just wondering what we can do there. We've, we've got a team that, you know, I think the one thing I most appreciate about environmental health is they work towards compliance. They're not heavy handed on the front end, but at what point do we get heavy handed? At what point do we do something about it? And so I, I don't need an answer tonight. It's not budget related. It just, it came up. So I brought it up. Um, the other concern I have on this one is, you know, I noted that the the Drury was one of the uh, projects that was listed on the, the spreadsheet, and it's it's not moving forward. They're they're looking to sell that property, and so we look at this pipeline. And I guess my question for you is, how realistic is that uh, pipeline, given the economic uncertainty, given the uh, inflationary pressures on building and development? Um, you know, how, how certain are we that that is going to continue to go forward the way that it looked like it might? So, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Nelson, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I know when we are looking at permit revenue, we are extremely conservative. Our CFO, I mean, we take the number and we probably – cut it in half because we want to make sure that we are being very cautious and realistic with what will come up, what will kind of bloom out of this uh, so pending recession. Um, but then we have developments like the Oxboro Heights that just pops out of nowhere that, you know, a couple of years ago we, we didn't even anticipate. So we put everything on that list knowing that, some will probably be delayed and others will be added that aren't even on our radar right now. No, and I appreciate that. And uh, my only follow up on that, and it, um, don't take it as a critique, I think it's good to be conservative, but we're looking at a very, very significant tax levy for people. And, you know, what I've heard is we're conservative there. Lodging admission tax, we were at 92% when the chart showed that we're maybe at 98 to 100% of 2019. We're being very conservative. And I'm just wondering, candidly, if we're being too conservative in some of those revenues and putting a levy increase in front of people that um, is going to hurt them that we don't need to do. Um, and so th that's why I brought that up, and, and I appreciate that. And, and personally, I think development will continue. Bloomington, as I noted in my first comment, is a place people continue to invest in. People want to have their business here. People want to live here. It's 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 good. We're we're a great community, and we're we're seeing a lot of good things. So, just one person's thoughts. And I appreciate your comments, Council Member, and um, likely uh, for item two point three to be honest as we continue the discussion as we go to look at the overall levy and budget we can have we can continue that conversation if that's okay all right council anything else very good thank right. you thank you all right so next uh is the parks and recreation department budget so we have um ann catry will be here and We'll also have uh, members of the Parks and Recreation team will be will help you to present. So welcome. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Good evening. Welcome. I did bring many members of my staff here uh, this evening, and um, I thought it might be nice for each of you to hear from each of my division managers. So first up is going to be Allison Warren. We have Peter Curvers from Gulf. We have Leah Hughes from the BCA, and we have Jill Murphy from Creekside. So you'll be hearing uh, real briefly, I promise. Oh, I'm sorry, where's Lenny? Lenny. <laughs> Lenny's hiding behind Peter. I knew I was forgetting somebody back there. <laughs> so, all right. Um, if we could, oh, I've got the remote here. As you know, I don't need to tell you that uh, Bloomington is very unique in what we offer in our park system. We have over 9,500 acres of parkland in Bloomington. 2,750 of those acres are owned by the city of Bloomington. Just over 2,600 of those are owned by Three Rivers Park District, and just over 4,000 of those are owned by the um, uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And 36% uh, of the land base in Bloomington is parkland. That is really extraordinary. Most communities are under 15%. 
Having said that, that's a lot of land to take care of. So I think uh, you'll hear a couple of recurring themes here. We have a significant lack of reinvestment in the park system in the last 30 to 40 years. Um, that's one thing I know you've heard from us as part of the park system master plan extensively. Um, and the other thing is staffing, staffing, hire, hiring, retention, and wages. Uh, those are a couple of our key themes uh, that you'll be seeing throughout our presentation this evening. So as I mentioned, uh, workforce, we have 25 full-time staff and over 300 seasonal and part-time staff. And honestly, this is a relatively small staff for a department of this size. Uh, besides aging facilities, one of our key significant challenges is hiring and retention in this really highly competitive workforce. Typically, we were competing against other municipalities when we hired and possibly the school district, and now we're competing with the private sector. We're competing with uh, restaurants, we're competing with grocery stores, we're competing with Target, um, and so our, our wages have uh, needed to become increasingly competitive to be able to, uh, to compete with those other agencies. Through the Park System Master Planning process, we evaluated not only the park system, but also our programming and staffing, and we're trying to establish priorities to meet the needs of our changing demographics and expectations in our community. And we've also recently created cost recovery expectations for our recreation facilities and also our recreation programs. And we've also created business plans for our recreation programs. So our first uh, division up is going to be recreation and I'm going to pass it on to Allison. Thanks for having me. Um, first is just our area of core programs. So through the Park System Master Plan, we identified 10 core program areas. They're listed here above. And these are all what we have to offer here in Parks and Recreation. So Anne mentioned one of our biggest challenges and the most significant increase that we're proposing in our budget is for staffing. Uh, in 2022, I'm sure many of you are aware, we are significantly impacted by our staffing shortages for our youth programs and our aquatic center. Uh, in particular, Summer Adventure Playgrounds, only two of our eight sites were open with limited capacity numbers and only 75 campers at Camp Coda per week were attending instead of over 200. We had over 600 participants on wait lists for summer programming. Um, and again, this is due to staffing and not being able to take on those participants. We had over 90 open positions for our youth programs and hired only 36 qualified applicants accepted a position. Um, a number of our applicants didn't respond to inquiries, didn't show up for interviews, but for the 90 positions, we only had 60 applications, not even necessarily any of them being qualified. Um, we received a total of 65 applications in 22, and that's a decrease of 48% from 2020. So we're continuously seeing lower and lower number of applications each year. We're requesting an average of over $4 per hour in our seasonal staff pay for youth programming, which totals a $66,000 increase in the part-time seasonal staff line item in the general fund. So as you can see below, there's a number of our normal positions, instructor, lead staff, specialist, assistant coordinator. We have our 2022 rate listed there as well as our proposed 23 rate and a few of our neighboring communities and their rates for 2022. Many of these were not able to provide us their 23 rates yet, but as you can see, we are lower on the low end this year and are really looking to increase those rates. One thing that we can note here is we have our already changed our building attendant position to a higher wage for ice rank staffing and we have received a significantly larger number of applications and we have attended the Bloomington High Schools at Jefferson and Kennedy and the eyes are shining bright of these high school students who really are interested in now applying for our positions at a higher wage. So this is the overall general fund budget. So this is everything uh, together for parks and recreation. So you can see um, the biggest increase is in salaries and benefits. And a big part of that is what Allison was just describing with the, um, the seasonal rates um, being increased significantly. So but overall, an increase of $400,000 in the general fund. And I think then, OK. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just gonna touch base quick on Creekside as it is part of the general fund. 
Um, so we are very busy at Creekside. We currently have 31 different ongoing senior programs from card groups to arts and crafts, fitness opportunities, as well as special events, bingo, um, ice cream parties, uh, and different uh, educational programs. And then we have our partner programs, um, for example, a fair for all, um, where it's a pop-up um, discounted grocery and other caregiver support groups. Um, so we have a lot of different activities going on. Um, just a reminder that in 21, we have a um, limited services budget, which included el em eliminating a full-time recreation supervisor, one part-time recreation coordinator, and a part-time kitchen coordinator. Um, so with our proposed 23 budget, it does include a new part-time coordinator position. Um, so we are seeing a, looking for an increase in our staffing to um, be able to continue to offer the variety of programs at Creekside. So on this slide, this is just the um, general fund portion that's for Creekside. So on the previous slide I just talked about, that was the entire parks and recreation budget in the general fund. This was included in that, uh, but we just wanted to pull out, since it is a separate facility, what just Creekside's budget looks like um, by itself. And so um, the increase um, salaries and benefits there, um, what Jill was describing with the part-time um, additional staffing, um, and then the capital expense here as well, which I think you have the details of the capital. The yeah, the, uh, the 25000 for 2023 would be uh, replacement of banquet chairs um, that are just wear and tear um, that are time to replace so we can continue to have rentals coming in. Be before you jump out yeah. and before the next jump in, uh, if you could introduce yourself just to make oh, sure that everybody on the yes. council and then everybody watching at home also knows who you are. Yes, I'm Jill Murphy. I'm the manager at Creekside Community Center. Thank you, Jill. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jill. And while, uh, while Peter is coming up, I just want to note, um, Jill mentioned the, uh, the cuts and the changes that, uh, that we made at Creekside during COVID. Jill and her team um, are a small but very mighty team. Uh, they do an extraordinary amount of work with a, with a very short um, short staff there. So Jill, thank you for, uh, for your efforts. So we're going to move on to our recreation facility and first up is Peter Curvers from Gulf. All right, thank you. And uh, if you didn't hear, I am Peter Curvers, uh, the golf course manager. I've uh, been uh, with City of Bloomington now five complete seasons. Uh, and as we get into the slides, which I guess I've got here, um, and we talk about uh, the COVID impacts and things. Obviously, Duan Golf Course has been on the positive end of, of this. Um, so in the last three years in particular, it's exploded. Uh, golf at Duan has always been popular, but uh, we, we took it to a whole new level in 20, we took it to another level in 21, and we found another level in 22 somehow. Um, so that's been very positive. Um, Duan, in addition to that, we host numerous leagues for men, women, and juniors, as well as corporate leagues. We expanded our corporate league uh, roster in this last year. Uh, and Duan, aside from that, I think the pandemic just confirmed what I already knew. Golf is very important in everybody's life, those that participate in the sport, and it enhances their physical as well as mental well-being um, and, and just as a quality part of their life. Uh, it's an activity that's also a lifetime activity, and I can't quantify this exactly because I didn't ask everyone their age, but uh, I think we had players there from as young as 8 to as old as 93, and maybe somebody out there can say, well, heck, I played Dwan this summer, I'm 98, and, and I apologize that I didn't, uh, didn't find that out. Um, so that's kind of the story at, at Dwan. Uh, as we dig into the revenues a little bit more in uh, the past three years, as you see, we've uh, increased rounds as well as gross revenues. Since 2019, revenues have increased 48% at Dwan, and rounds have increased 35%. 2022, rounds were down, revenue was up, but actually rounds per available play dates that we had, because we, we opened much later in 2022, uh, our revenue per day and rounds per day were up over 21 as well. Then, uh, as we say, with the staffing is one of our big challenges. Um, we have five full-time 
employees at the golf course, which is actually down two full-time employees pre-pandemic. So we've, we've managed to increase rounds in revenue with, with less full-time staff. Uh, staff retention uh, has been relatively good at Duan during my tenure here, but we have found as each year goes by, it gets harder and harder to attract new candidates. So we do have attrition and we get, as was, was alluded to earlier, we got fewer applicants for our positions. Um, minimum wage, we're, we're proposing to increase our, our wage. They're all a little bit different, but our starting wage was as low as 11.50 per hour, which I think in today's world is not even remotely realistic. Um, and so we're, we're proposing $15 as our base level for all our positions going into 2022. And again, as was alluded to earlier, the feedback that we got from our customers was extremely positive this year. Uh, it's, it's really interesting that our rounds can go up, but due to the, the efforts of our hardworking ground staff and really our full department, we maintain impeccable course conditions throughout the year and, and just got positive comments that uh, the golf course was as good as it's ever been in the, in the history of, of Duan. So that's really, really nice to hear. And also, they, I got a lot of feedback about the friendliness of the staff and how helpful everybody is in all the departments. So then I think that kind of wraps that up. And Makari, I believe you're going to, yep. So I'm just going to highlight the overall budget. So the, the 23 budget request compared to 22, the expenses are going up um, almost $244,000. We're going to look at the long-term budget model next that will also have the revenues on there and the impact on the working capital balance. Um, but the, the big increase in salaries and benefits is the temporary seasonal um, wages that Peter was just describing. And then there's definitely um, increases in utilities and um, supplies. Um, there's some capital increases as well in the um, 23 budget. If we go to the next slide. So here is what the, um, the long-term model looks like for for the golf fund. It does um, look a lot better than before with we've had some great um, revenues um, in the last few years or a couple of years. Um, so that's definitely helping the working capital balance. Um, right now we do still have, this is the golf fund. Um, so uh, we no longer have Highland uh, revenues or expenses as part of this fund, but there was still like a deficit balance within there. And so we do have um, property tax coming in to, to help, um, get that deficit balance back to zero and then stopping in 2024. Um, and just overall, we've got the revenues at a little like 1.9 million, 1,963,000, and then expenses a little under 1.9 million. So um, a positive outlook for the golf fund. Any questions for golf before we go to the next one? So 2025, we're, we we finally have eliminated the the deficit from Highland. Is that correct? Correct, Mayor Councilmember. That's yeah. correct. Good to know, Councilmember Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> and this slide shows my concern, which I've raised before, is um, you know we have property tax revenue that is going into this to make it look profitable, and then when that goes away, we're showing a loss of eighty thousand, ninety one thousand. Um, moving forward, and that's projecting continued increases in golf, which may or may not happen. I mean, the last few years have been anomalies. The average of the last five years was about 1.5 million in revenue, and we're projecting in 2026 a you know 33 percent increase over those really good years. And so, I continue to be very concerned about this fund um, obviously I think Dewan is an important asset to the community and things like that but I think it is important for us to at least consider alternative uh, uh, things and uh, you know we did something with Highland with Three Rivers that seems to have worked out for both organizations and, and I don't mean this with any disrespect I'm just concerned about this budget the only way it's profitable is for us to put property taxes into it even in the forecasting Thank you, Council Member. Anyone looking to respond to that? Or <laughs> well, 
Well, again, I think I think you look at it. It is it is challenging. We we are a fee based structure, um, so if if you look at uh, it's it's highly labor intensive, as well as uh, cost intensive with fuel and, and different things of that nature. Um, Golf is strong. I do believe that, uh, again, the crystal ball that none of us can look into accurately and see where it's at, but uh, municipal golf is something that's really under pressure within the, the golf community and even public golf in general. Um, so the demand is, is extremely high. So I think the, the ability to keep this in a city the size of, of Bloomington is, is of paramount importance, not only for the, for the game, but I don't think there's a, there's a community in America that's lesser for having a golf course. Uh, the values that it promotes, uh, the, as I alluded to, the quality of life that it provides for, for people of all ages is almost unmatched with other things that cities offer. Um, so I don't disagree with you with the financial challenges and, and maybe looking at it in a crystal ball and seeing that it could could require subsidies. But I also think in the broader sense, the, the place it holds within a community is nothing but positive. And I would add as well that uh, from an operational perspective, um, I don't think that there are many, if any, golf courses in the state of Minnesota that have more rounds than Duan does. And uh, I would also uh, be willing to say that I don't know that there is a more efficient operation in the state of Minnesota. Um, again, Peter and his team do an amazing job with a very small staff. And I just want to reiterate what Peter said about course conditions for a golf course that had over 50,000 rounds this year and to have the conditions of the course at the end of the season that they did was really truly nothing short of remarkable. So kudos to Peter and his team. Thank you. Let's see Councilmember Lohman and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, you know, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and also uh, to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Nelson, I think it's a, a good point that you brought forward. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm concerned about the labor prices when we look at the inflationary uh, uh, pressure on that, that that's going to be something we're going to need to look at uh, if that conti that trend continues long term. So I'm wondering if staff has, has looked at any uh, models that are in the private sector in terms of automation. Um, I know at one point uh, staff was looking at um, maybe he's trying to see if we could attract uh, you know, a national uh, golf museum for the Midwest, if that's still on or if that's a possibility for maybe even this particular location. And I particularly look at that building that's over there. Um, and I know that was something we had looked to, to try to push into trying to get something, a replacement for that. And that's because I just think of that building as I drive by it every day uh, when I'm leaving, leaving the district. And I think about what could be there in terms of that building. It could be a banquet facility. It could be uh, something that could be used year round. And it, just even some of the food options, uh, if that had changed, if that's uh, made available. So I guess really what my question is, is that, you know, you know certainly, um, uh, I believe that staff's put together a good uh, presentation here, but I'm wondering what are the things we can do to, to help kind of innovate and uh, try to utilize that space uh, to try to get it to kind of its next next level as we have this time in between. So I, I think it's I think it's okay to put a little bit of um, uh, money, uh, t uh, taxpayer money, in there to to kind of get us to a certain point. But I'm just wanting to really hear what the what the vision may be uh, if these realities are are true. Um, you know, with this pressure of not being able to support it once that money comes away. So I'm not really looking for a comment, but it's just a one council member's uh, thought, unless there's something you wanted to, wanted to add with that. I would add one thing um, as it relates to the building and any potential revenues. Um, one thing that we are um, really short on at Duan is space. Um, when we look at a potential... Um, banquet facility at Duan, we have a real parking problem there. Um, our parking lot is full with golfers. And so to think about bringing in a, a banquet venue there that would be especially busy on the weekends when our golf course is absolutely full, I don't know where we would park people. Um, that's a problem. 
we could potentially look at, uh, you know, some sort of a restaurant facility there, something that might be year round, something that would bring in some additional revenues. That is certainly an option. Again, we are space constrained there. Um, restaurants since COVID have been struggling. Um, but if we look at a new facility, I think it would definitely be worthwhile uh, when we replace the clubhouse at Dewan to consider a variety of different options, um, including a restaurant, a year-round restaurant potentially. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, I, I was curious um, as I was listening to Councilmember Nelson um, to just kind of think through the other amenities we offer to the public that don't in and of themselves carry profit. And what I mean by that is, uh, I guess the question I'm asking is, do we expect Duan to be self-sustaining when we don't, for example, expect Creekside to, or the ice garden to, well, let's not use the ice garden, the uh, aquatic center to you to be, or, you know, other park and rec amenities that we have. So I, I, I wondered if, if, that, if the expectation is that each of these amenities should be profitable or at least break even in and of themselves, then maybe we should do the budgeting even differently here. Um, but I thought that was kind of a unique thought and maybe I misinterpreted what Council Member Nelson said, but I, 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 didn't, I don't think it's a big deal to have, you know, some property tax dollars going towards a public amenity, it seems like we do that in lots of places. And so I was just curious as to why we think, if we do think that Duan should be an exception to that rule. Thank you. Thank you, council member. And yes, that's the, that's been an ongoing discussion and, and a good, good, good discussion because yes, um, Valley View Park doesn't make money, but we subsidize it as a city because it's an asset to the city and it's something that we want. Um, I don't think Bush Lake makes a profit. Um, you're right with with the aquatic center, and, and yes, you're right with golf. And so that then becomes the discussion that we need to have, I think, as a community. Do we consider a golf course, do we consider a, an aquatic center, another one of our parks? And like the other parks, uh, it does require financial support from the city. Now, unlike Valley View, it makes these do make some money and offset this in some way, but for the most part, obviously, there's a deficit there. Uh, I think it's a, a discussion that we need to have moving forward, just in terms of how we look at all of our, our public amenities, our public parks in this way, and decide if that is something, if that's how we want to approach that. And if it is, then we make that decision as a community and move forward in that way. But I agree. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Council Member Lohman? So just a, just a question, and it may be, uh, maybe this has changed since I've been on council, but my understanding was that the... Uh, that the, the golf uh, piece was considered to be an enterprise fund. And, uh, and so my understanding in terms of the, the what's built into that, uh, that enterprise fund idea is that, you know, that you're, you're striving to try to get, you know, into the black or, you know, turn a revenue. Uh, so I'm not, I don't want to be careful in here. I'm not disagreeing with you. And certainly we could, you know, shift that around. So I'm not, not saying, but, uh, that's you know kind of I think the spirit of what Councilmember Nelson is kind of bringing forward is that kind of that thought that that, that this is a an enterprise fund. Um, so and, and and you're exactly right. It is indeed an enterprise fund, and as enterprise funds, it's expected yes to to make money and to be profitable. Um, the the point I was making, and I think the point that Councilmember D'Alessandro made, is it time to rethink that in some way? Perhaps golf should not be an enterprise fund. Should it, it should be considered a park like are many parks across the, the community that they don't pay for themselves, but they're certainly a community asset that we value. No, I think we're definitely on the same page. Just want to make sure that, yep. that that's probably the, the thrust of where that's coming from. Yep, exactly. And Council member, uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Berber. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council members. I think um, a helpful caveat to that discussion is that in our enterprise funds, uh, while we do uh, want them to uh, operate in the black, that's the operations and so it has not been unusual for us to have taxpayer subsidy for capital uh, so you'll recall with the with the ice garden uh, we have uh, we have property tax that goes into the ice garden operation to support uh, the capital reinvestment that we've made uh, we're starting to see that the operation requires assistance as well but 
historically, we have tried to make sure that the operating uh, doesn't have to be a drain on the property taxpayers. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. And I agree with all that, and I, I appreciate that sentiment. And I, I don't have a uh, challenge particularly supporting an amenity of this nature. And I appreciate uh, Council or uh, Mr. Rugi's comments with regards to capital. It looks like there's 120,000 in that budget in that area, so th that makes sense. My my concerns uh, about this one is there is honestly a viable alternative to us running it that may cost us significantly less money there isn't a viable alternative to run big or valley view park or anything like that and we've seen that it's worked at highland and so that's the reason i bring it up is does that alternative make sense to look at in terms of that uh, the other question i have is there is a hundred sixty one thousand dollars of property tax that's in our levy this year um, for that operation. If we take that out, it brings our working capital down to 96% of goal, just about 97% of goal. So fairly close to goal. We're obviously looking at a significant levy and you know, does it make sense for us to consider not doing that subsidy this year given the amount of increase for uh, residents and businesses within the community? So just, just a thought, I know we'll talk about that later. But thanks for bringing that up. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I'm looking back at the Duong Golf Course um, fees. And whenever, so we're talking about going from a $37 fee to a $40, and then you have the comparison cities and their fees. Are those fees from 2022 or what we project for 2023? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Carter, those fees are 2022. Okay. Uh, so fully expect uh, the pressures that we're having, they all have as well. So I, I, I fully expect all those fees to raise at those other facilities. Okay. Because another thought too is um, assuming they raise um, because they're experiencing similar pressures, I almost wonder, I mean, is 40 then going to be one of the, are we going to be on the lower side still in terms of our fee and would we want to consider a slightly higher increase in the fee to help? with some of the the issues that we're talking about in the golf fund. So just putting it out there, I don't need an answer, but an idea. Thank you, Council Member. Any other comments, ideas, thoughts on this? Thank you very much. Good evening, Council. My name is Lenny Schmitz. I'm the Ice Garden Manager I'm at the Bloomington Ice Garden and uh, presenting our budget tonight. Um, <clears throat> just a high-level overview. Bloomington Ice Garden serves residents of all ages, just like golf, from 3 to 83, I think, uh, with our skate school programs and our adult groups that skate at the rink and uh, the youth programs that are there. Um, per program participation varies significantly from our skate school to our high school hockey teams to the youth associations, camps, national tournaments, and figure skating competitions um, that happen throughout the year, 12 months long. Um, our most significant budget impacts, uh, like others that you've heard, are staffing wages, primarily part-time related, but also utility costs. That is uh, when you're refrigerating 100,000 square feet plus of space and heating 100,000 square feet plus of space and utility costs go up you know, 10 to 20%, it's a significant increase in our budget. Um, uh, one of the other additions that we've taken on this year is the uh, concession operation, which we took over in April of, of this year. Um, we still don't really know what that means. We've uh, projected some uh, additional revenues there, but how much is still to be determined. Uh, we had a very successful weekend last weekend and the high school season just started. So we're, we're learning a lot every single day related to concessions. Um, in our 23 budget, we had requested uh, an upgrade of a position from a part-time to a full-time. Um, that is not included, but that would have been a, about a $61,000 increase with benefits and, and added salaries. Um, you'll see an increase in our budget for, like I mentioned, part-time staffing wages um, and some additional hours for a full 12 month operation of our concession operation. So that's a, about 35,000 for the year. 
And then uh, significant increases for utilities, gas and electric, over $100,000 um, needed just to make up, uh, just to, to keep the lights on and, and everything heated and cooled. Um, and then just inflationary costs in general, uh, toilet paper isn't getting any cheaper, paper towels, chemicals, all of the fun stuff that, that make, uh, make the facility function um, are increasing significantly. The cost of a hot dog that we're selling, all that, all that stuff adds up. Um, so here's uh, our high level overview. Um, so you can see those increases in salaries and benefits with uh, wages. And then there's a significant increase, as Lenny said, with uh, utilities costs. Um, that's the, their biggest increases in utilities. Um, a slight decrease in capital, slight decrease in debt service. So overall, um, $211,000 increase to their expenses for the ice garden budget. And the majority of that is in their uh, utilities. Uh, so this is the long-term budget for the Ice Garden Fund. Um, so you can see uh, we do have some two different property tax line items that are coming in. So one amount, the top amount there, when we're looking at the overall tax levy that we have proposed for 2023, that Two hundred thousand dollars is included in the debt service amount. So when you're look, when we look at this later, for the overall tax levy that is um, included in debt service, and so the amount for operations is one hundred twenty five thousand that we have for the ice garden. And then um, the revenues are predicted there, forecasted at uh, one million seven hundred sixty nine thousand. So just a little over two million with all of those together, and then you can see the. Um, expenses there at 2.2 million. So we are um, projecting a, a loss for 2023. So we're we do have a few years. It's not going to go negative, but uh, lower than the goal that we have for this fund. And then um, hope to come back in 2026. Are there any questions for the ice garden? Thank you. And I think again, to your point, council member, Nelson, it's, uh, and Councilmember Lohman, it's the question that, the, the discussion that we probably should should have. I mean, is this an enterprise fund? Do we want to treat it as such? Do we expect it to work in the black, or is this a a park amenity like other parks that just happens to make a few bucks every now and again, and offset some of the cost of what it's what it costs to uh, to operate it in the community? Councilmember uh, Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I guess the only the only thing I would elevate in this conversation, and I, I'm seeing these the property tax support for operations looking in years forward, and um, that's, I mean, that's a significant number. And that's, I mean, we look to 2025, and we're getting even above the number that we were subsidizing um, our licensing operation, our driver's license operation, um, which... Some of us on this council felt like that was too much to justify continuing it. So um, I'm engaging in one of my trademarks here and, and raising a problem without providing a solution. But um, I think, I mean, this is this is something that, that I think is going to be concerning moving forward. And I think we're going to have to do either, re well, we're going to have to think about it differently and or do something differently because that's, I mean, that's a significant number. Councilmember D'Alessandro, is that a new hand? Yes, Mr. Mayor, it is. Um, it, it, it's related to what uh, Councilmember Coulter was saying, basically, that, that I think if we look at every single one of these enterprise funds, the four of them that we're going through right now, Dwan, the big, um, I think the, um, the uh, um, aquatic center is going to come up, and I think we have one more, right? Um, they're, all, uh, they're all asking for subsidy from a product property tax perspective center for the arts as an example and so you know um I, I don't know when the appropriate time is to have the kind of more esoteric or philosophical conversation about what our expectation of of items that are enterprise funds are um but i think it, it it's raising the, the necessary conversation at, at, you know and if it's now great if it's later maybe that's in you know the part of the beginning of next year but the um to me 
there's some if we're going to have a methodology for one, we should probably have a methodology for all of them. Or we have to be specific about why we were going to we're going to hold you know the golf course to a standard that's different than the big, for example, or something like that. But I think it would be worthy worth us having that dialogue together. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Nelson. Just for fun, I'm going to contradict myself. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this one actually, uh, there's there's two things that I that I wanted to note. Um, one, there are no capital costs. Twenty four, twenty five, twenty six. Is there a reason for that? Uh, Mayor, Council members, Council Member Nelson, um, a vast majority of our our capital outlay <clears throat> has been. Things greater than $50,000 is what you would see there. So there's a lot of smaller projects. Also, a vast majority of the capital uh, investment or the CIP items were lumped into a major renovation. So things that would have been smaller projects as in like 100, 200, 300,000 hour projects um, are all being proposed as part of a major renovation. And we also have a gap, uh, 2027 or 28, you'd see another Zamboni replacement in there, which is to the tune of like 100 and escalated out to about $180,000 at that point. So there's there's a little bit of a gap there okay. um, with that. That's good. Just want to make sure we weren't missing something. So, um, And then the second thing, so uh, <clears throat> to Councilmember Coulter's point of it's going up to $300,000 um, for the operations, you know, part of me thinks that's because we're keeping it as low as we can today. And this is the part where I contradict myself. <laughs> so, you know, are we doing enough in terms of that property tax on operations now? Because we see that we're dipping down to, you know, 45% of the working capital goal next year. And then we have to have these large increases in 25, 26 to start to make up for that and replenish the working capital and is that a conscious decision there um you know again like i said i'm exactly the opposite of what i said on Dwan, but you know that's of concern on my end that we're 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 pushing some things we and not to get too far afield but you know we've got fire coming up that we're going to have to find a way to fund 18 firefighters uh after this uh grant runs out and you know, do we are we building in a structural deficiency in this budget at this time? Um, is a concern for me. Council, anything additional? If I may, Mayor, the one one other item just to mention, just in general. Um, you know, with all of our recreation facilities, but specifically with the Bloomington Ice Garden, is the economic impact that it has that doesn't show up on any of these slides. The last time we visited with the Chamber and the Visitor Bureau on this is, they've, they estimated the Bloomington Ice Garden has about a $3.65 million impact on our community annually. You know, the hospitality and the hotel industry <clears throat> is extremely important in our community. If people aren't coming for hockey tournaments or figure skating competitions, um, visiting our local restaurants and, and establishments before and after, um, they would all feel it. They call, they want to know our schedule because our schedule dicta dictates their staffing and their schedule. So that's one of the things that all of our recreation facilities don't necessarily show up in a budget item, but when it comes to the revenue coming into the city, um, these uh, these facilities do have an impact that, that you might not see here, um, but does directly impact the community and, and our budgets overall. Very good point, thank you. Anything further, Council? All right, thank you much. Council members, I'm Leah Hughes. I manage the Center for the Arts. Where am I pointing this? Yes. Okay. All right, so Bloomington Center for the Arts um, has over 113,000 annual arts-related visits. This is mainly to visits to the gallery, um, education classes, and ticketed performances. Um, the reason why that number is so high is the farmer's market, special events, commission meetings, rentals, they all bring people in the building who then happen upon a gallery or find a performance they want to attend. And so the parks and rec activities and city department activities that happen near or in this space are really a driver for those attendance numbers. 
Um, the annual ticketed attendance for 2022 is 20,000 estimated. This is down um, 30,000 from pre-COVID numbers in 2019. So a significant decrease. Um, obviously COVID impacts are still here. They're still happening in addition to um, inflation impacts when people are hurting in other areas um, and enrichment opportunities tend to go by the wayside. So we're still seeing impacts um, for some of our events in relation to COVID and um, inflation. Um, we have a lot of functions here that are, are city driven and or just guest rentals that come in. So we have a lot of different um, private functions that happen in the space, um, which keep it busy um, seven days a week. And then within the last um, couple of years, um, while the performances have been quieter, we've been doing some capital improvement projects. And what, that's where that $1 million endowment has um, predominantly been used is for some of the, the spaces, the Black Box and the Schneider Theater, where we've had upgrades um, in relation to end of life or just functionality issues that we were seeing um, in 2019. So remedying some of those issues um, while we have the time and the space and the money to do that. Um, Center for the Arts fees, we are just keeping them um, as is. They are at market rate. Um, the local competitors that were researched were Hopkins Center for the Arts, the Ames Center, um, Minnesota Masonic, and actually even Bloomington Public Schools. It's not really an apples to apples with Bloomington Public Schools, but it's always a good idea to keep an eye on those guys too. Um, there will also be no facility rental increases. Again, we are at market rate um, and the, the facility wage slides that Kari showed earlier shows um, where some of those competitors are and where the Bloomington Center for the Arts falls within the rates that they are charging for similar amenities. Um, the city facility user fee, which is the per ticket fee that we charge the resident arts groups will also remain at $2.50. Um, in 2020, there was conversation about raising that eventually, but again, with the COVID impacts that we're seeing, um, inflation and decreases in ticket sales, they're roughly at about 40% for a lot of the resident groups and guest groups we have coming, which is pretty consistent across a lot of theaters um, in the area just holding those per ticket fees for now, um, we felt is probably prudent in order to help support some of the groups we have here. Um, the increases that you'll see in later slides really are in relation to those part-time staffing wage increases. I have art staff that work in the evenings and the weekends, work for performances, and then um, theater technicians that help um, support the groups that are performing here. Um, that's where those staffing increases are coming from. Um, as I mentioned, COVID-19 and, and um, uh, inflation are causing that that impact and the, so the 40 percent um, 40 percent of house sold is what we're seeing across all um, resident arts groups no matter what art genre they are and then obviously the the uncertainty with artistry has kind of caused a pause for a lot of things just waiting to see um, what the business status of that resident group they are the largest resident group um, performing the most on the theater um, running the galleries and the education programs that predominantly happen so depending on their business status which hopefully we'll know in the next couple of weeks that will have an impact um, potentially on the 2023 budget do you want me to talk about this or do you I can. Okay. Um, I'll just say overall the it's not changing much, right? The um, the increases that are there are offset by um, a lower capital number. So the 2023 budget in total expenses is very similar to the 2022 budget. And then the long term model, as I said before, um, we have not made any changes in here um, in regards to what might happen with artistry. So. Um, what we have here is with artistry still um, remaining you know, in business and um, with the shows that they have been doing. So um, things that might change if that changes is if we had to have some additional staff, that can be offset with what we've got there for additional artistry support or in the cultural arts grants. So there's some things that could um, change in there, but for now, we're, this is how, how we're showing it. Um, and the working capital balance, um, initially, when we did the initial capital projects, you can see there's a lot of capital this year. Um, as, as Leah said, in 2021, we did receive a million dollars in from the endowment transfer. And so that um, basically in 2022 and 2023 is being spent in capital. Um, so there are some capital projects that have been kind of pushed out to make sure that that working capital balance remains positive, but it does um, dip down in 2026.
Council questions? No questions. Well done. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. If you missed me before, I'm Allison Warren. I'm the recreation <laughs> manager for the city. But we're going to talk about aquatics this time. So uh, the Bloomington Family Aquatic Center opened in 1971. As mentioned in our previous conversation, a number of staffing challenges again here with lifeguards and other seasonal employees to keep this facility running. And Bush Lake Beach is our other facility that's in the aquatics fund. In 2020, we stopped charging for parking and no longer have seasonal lifeguards concessions or a parking fee. It's an all free access beach. And overall, over the past two years, we've had a really positive feedback with those changes and have done surveys to continue to maintain that experience with our community. So staffing, again, we are having challenges here. We are looking at the same increase from our seasonal youth programs, so requesting a $4 average for some of our seasonal pay resulting in over $100,000 increase in our part-time seasonal staff line item. The two located there are our attendant and lifeguard are our highly, high, most highly used positions here at the Aquatic Center. As you can see, our rate is extremely low compared to some of our competitors in the New York area. Like Ann mentioned previously, we're not just competing against other cities, but against other for-profit businesses like Great Wolf Lodge and others. And as you notice here, here is open positions. We had 20 and 40 for attendant and lifeguard receiving minimal applications and hiring not even close to enough for people that we need. So what we did this year with some strategic use of assistant coordinators and other co higher level coordinator positions in the aquatic center, we were able to fill those hours. But if we were not able to do that, there would have been significant reduced hours or amenities daily in 2022. And similar to other budgets, recreation facilities, the staffing, the big increase is due to that part-time seasonal staff increase, wage increase. Um, there is a bit of an increase for capital compared to 2022 and the 23 budget as well. So overall, 180000 in expenses. And then uh, long-term model, um, similar to golf, um, the Aquatics Fund has had uh, very high sales. It's been... Um, the weather's uh, really cooperated with uh, pool revenue. So um, that's been very nice the last couple of years. So that's really helped this fund. Um, but we do, it, it does look, it's very positive compared to goal for 2023, 24, but there is um, a little trend of it coming down again. So uh, we'll watch that closely. Um, kind of the same thing with, um, you know, looking at the other recreation facility funds and what type of property tax support they'll need. I should also note that as far as capital goes, we are in the process of replacing the pool filters at the Bloomington Family Aquatic Center with the strategic funds funding that you provided to us earlier this year. So there are other capital things happening within this, just not here in this budget. Council, questions on aquatics? Councilmember Lohman. So um, I think this goes not only for the aquatics, but for some of the uh, seasonal programming for um, uh, for kids as well that we talked about earlier, and some of the impacts from that from, from last year. I'm just recalling a number of the folks that I know that uh, had families that became a real problem because that was what they were planning on doing to you know, take some time away <laughs> from their kids during the... Have, have we done it in the past where we've put any additional funds so that um, so that uh, you know either through aquatics or that you know through some of these other funds where they could increase that to try to meet uh, some of that those market pressures is there have we done that is there a way to do that uh, to, to give some flexibility because I just wonder when we get right around that summer period of time trying to create that uh, stability for families, I think, is really important. So I, I don't know if that's possible or if that's a, if there's a way to do that. Um, uh, but I just I want to ask the question, Lisa Mayor. And I don't know. I'd look to Ms. Catry. <laughs> uh, 
uh, Council Member Lohman, uh, Mayor, members of the Council, I'll uh, maybe give a quick answer and uh, let Allison chime in. Uh, but I think it's important to note that we offer a wide variety of recreational programs during the summer, but we have traditionally not offered childcare or daycare type of services. Um, some families certainly have attempted to use our recreation programs as daycare, really inexpensive daycare. Um, but that is not uh, that has not been our philosophy in the past. So if it's something that uh, the council would like us to pursue, uh, we most certainly could pursue something like that. Uh, but the cost would be very high. You know, we'd be looking at a, at a staffing cost, and depending upon the expected uh, cost recovery, um, it would it would come at a very high cost to the city. Mm -hmm. Wow, I didn't hear myself ask that question. <laughs> um, I, I guess maybe I, I maybe misunderstood what I was asking for. I, I figured that some families use this a, as a way of helping them to, to provide child care over the summer. I didn't realize that some people were trying to use it for all of their daycare. Um, and that, that's certainly not what I was, was asking for. Um, I just, uh, what I, from what I heard, um, is that uh, some some families were, were utilizing this as a time to kind of get away and do family type things and they were kind of relying on that so really what my question was is uh, uh, you know to help those uh, those families that are trying to find additional uh, uh, multiple ways of being able to to, to kind of get out of the house and find inexpensive ways of doing that um, that we look to make sure that there is staffing there by trying to provide some some amount of a surge fund. So that's uh, uh, to to have a different you know, additional uh, payment so you can be able to compete in the marketplace. So that that's uh, certainly have an interest in that question, but that's not what my question was today. I do have an interest in that, but that's not what my question was today in terms of that. So hopefully that's a little more clear. What I'm asking. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Lohman. Um, with additional resources, we could use some additional staff to offer additional programming. I, I think that is the I think that is the short answer. I think Allison and her team uh, have done a good job utilizing the resources uh, that we've been given in the past. Uh, but if there are additional programs that could be offered uh, with additional funds, uh, we'd be happy to pursue it. Well, and I think what I've heard in each of the presentations is you're seeking those additional resources to make sure that you're at the staffing level that people have come to expect. And so I, and I think that's entirely appropriate because to hear the numbers that you talked about earlier for the, the, the summer programming, it's um, we know what people expect and value and prioritize here in Bloomington, and we're not meeting that. And it's not a shortcoming of the city of Bloomington. It's a shortcoming of the fact that there are no people to, to work those, and so we have to offer the incentive to get them there to work for us. So I, I think, I mean, to your question, council member, you know, the, the idea of a surge fund might make sense. I think we're seeing a request for a surge fund. Basically, we need more money to, to bring the people in so we can offer the programming that we want to offer. Yeah, and I just, what I'm, what I'm hoping is if there's, you know, if we could tack a little bit on there, you know, extra if they needed it, uh, so you'd have to come back and make a request, and by that point, it's too late at that point, you know, yep. you get a little extra money, and you kind of say, okay, we'll, we'll tap into that, you know, we kind of have a, a capital fund down here for, you know, that type of thing, you know, maybe there's some kind of other, you know, uh, employee fund that we could have. A human it, capital fund. Here you go, here you go. <laughs> I'm not good at name, at naming things, but that's, I like that name. Mayor, Council Member Lohman, Council Members, we also did start an incentive program to get staff to come to us as a sign-on bonus, a retention bonus, and a referral bonus. So a number of options to also hopefully give us a little more incentive for people to come to us first. Um, and as mentioned, with the ice rink position currently, we are seeing a strong increase in staff, and so we're hoping to see that continue into the summer. I also just want to mention it's not necessarily budget related, but we have had some issues with registration in the past, filling up in two minutes or so. I'm sure many of you have heard that or experienced it yourself. Uh, we are in the process of implementing a lottery system this year to have a more equitable access for everyone to participate in our programs. So um, nothing finalized, don't call me out on the dates, but we would hold um, lottery open for a week so you could come in and use paper. You wouldn't have to go online. It doesn't have to be at 9 a.m. on the dot. It gives you these opportunity to really have people in different working areas, working pieces, different children, that type of thing, to have that opportunity. Uh, so that is a change we are making here moving forward and hoping that will make um, the process a bit more smooth for our residents. I think that's a very good idea, considering many of the stories that I've heard 
Uh, I think that's a very good idea. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. And, and uh, apologies as I'm thinking about this, some of these questions are kind of bleeding back into the fee uh, conversation. Uh, just overall, do we have an idea, um, maybe just from the last year, how many of our pass holders are purchasing them at full price versus the reduced price based on the school district criteria that was laid out there? Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Martin, I don't have the particular number in front of me, uh, but I believe in 2019 it was like 40% of our passes were passed, were purchased by free or reduced lunch rates okay. or on halfway half pay. So they're still looking for that discounted rate, but we are still seeing a really high number of passes being purchased. They increase every single year, and so we're con hoping to continue to see that. If we look at the list, last one maybe, we are regularly over over receiving our revenues, but the weather has really played oh. quite a part in that. It hasn't rained in a couple years. So <laughs> it it really helps us out. Um, I think there, one of our staff members said we, for every degree it increases, we make like an extra $300 a day, um, depending on the weather, just for daily pass, pass entries. Gotcha. Well, and I guess along those lines, so that's 40% utilizing that reduced rate, roughly kind of ballpark but that's 40% that we're able to get in in that very fast registration window. So we may see if it's a random distribution. Are you talking about pool passes or? Uh, season passes to the family aquatic. So season passes will not be on a lottery. We don't have a maximum oh. number of people that could purchase a season pass. Okay. So they will, everyone will still be able to purchase a season pass for the pool. Um, we don't have a limit on that. One thing I will note is that we don't have a fund that helps subsidize that. It's just coming off the top of our revenues. So the more we see the use of our free and reduced lunch or what we call our fee assistance program, the less amount of revenues we're really seeing here in our budgets. Okay. And, and just uh, last thought briefly, I, I'm wondering if moving forward, uh, I, I understand kind of the breakdown you had with comparable cities on the, the cost of those season passes and the discounts for additional passes. But kind of the examples you provided is only like a seven dollar discount for pass number two, so it wasn't hugely substantial. So I, I'm wondering if there's a way that we could, across the board, bring our pass structure more in line, but be able to more, in a more targeted fashion, earmark out of those increased revenues for so it's not coming out of the top line, just kind of across the board. If, anyway, I just when I when I see we're charging half the rates of others, there's got to be a way we could be targeted about not impacting from an equity standpoint. So, yeah. thank you, council member. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I, um, I wanted to, I guess, ask a, a related question about the, um, and maybe maybe this is addressed by the lottery system, but <clears throat> I did I did also hear a lot about, um, you know, the challenges of people being able to access those, um, the the services we offered in the summertime and how quickly. All over the place, not just at the, not just within Bloomington, but with um, with everyone's programs. You know, they're um, they, they sold out quickly. You know, I heard it about the Y. I heard it about the stuff at the um, at the Children's Museum. I mean, everything. So um, it, there's obviously a demand, and you know, I, I wondered if I wondered if I haven't. I'm maybe in this. <laughs> is is there a connection to like our strategic plan? Uh, such that we should be being more uh, purposeful about ensuring that we have enough funds set aside, strategic, operational, or otherwise, for these kinds of programs. Given given what we've what we have heard about our strategic plan and the need for us to support um, our families. Uh, in in the in the area, uh, we just haven't really tied today this budget going into 2023 to that strategic plan. I mean, maybe you all have. I I we haven't really talked about it that way in, in my mind, and so I'm wondering if there's a a reason from our strategic priorities work over the summer that we should be thinking in this particular space ex explicitly more about investment. I just want to throw that out there for consideration. Good thoughts, Council Member. Um, Mr. Verbrugge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, you will recall that we did talk about accessibility to um, recreation and park programming uh, during that conversation this summer, and staff, uh, during some brainstorming, uh, identified some areas where we thought we could um, make a substantial impact, and the, the issue there simply is cost. And so the uh, the 
the opportunity I think to bring that forward in a in a um, budget discussion is going to take some preparation more than what we had for this year. Um, so we will have it on the work plan when we come forward uh, to take a look at, but that's a pretty significant um, commitment that we discussed earlier. I think the conversation about uh, looking at um, you know how we can uh, charge a fair rate and also um, provide an equitable opportunity for people depending on uh, income qualification or some other criteria is an important part of what we do. Um, I think that everybody recognizes that what we have been charging for our programming historically is um, surprisingly low. And so the fact that people have come to depend on it for uh, summer programming is, I understand that that wasn't what Councilmember Lohman was asking about, but in many ways it is the outcome of having a very affordable option for what we do with, with our summer programming. And if I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, just to, to, to <laughs> add to that, I mean, to your point, Mr. Verbrugge, the that isn't necessarily a bad thing if it's a strategic priority for us. Concur. Okay, thanks. Councilmember Carter and then Councilmember Loman. Councilmember Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so whether it was our intention or not, I mean, summer camps, summer programs are child care in the summer for families, especially those of us with school-age kids. I mean... Those are our options. We can't get into daycare centers or things like that. And so um, I'm, I just want to say, I guess, out loud that I'm very supportive of figuring out ways to make this doable financially because, I mean, I know I personally have had so many families reach out to me just at their wits end trying to figure out child care for the summer or before and after school care, which, of course, is separate from us. Um, and so I think it should absolutely be a strategic priority for us. And then I also want to say that I really appreciate that you're changing the registration system to a lottery because I was one of the people last time like trying to register and it was kind of a nightmare. And so I think about the fact that I could sit there at 9 a.m. on a Tuesday morning or whatever and I have a master's degree and English is my first language and I have Wi-Fi and like and I still had the hardest time. And so I really appreciate that you're making it more accessible and equitable for everybody in our community. Mayor, Council Member Carter, I really want to give uh, Allison and her team uh, a lot of credit for that. Um, this is, it's a hard thing to do, and Allison and her team actually pushed for the last two years our recreation software to change to be able to allow for a lottery system. So Allison and her team were really able to influence one of the largest recreation software program manufacturers in the country uh, to make this change. So it was a, it was a really big deal. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you for doing that. Maybe you could talk to Ticketmaster. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody could do it, Allison could. Councilmember Lohman. <laughs> That's pretty good. Man. I'll call on my Swifties to back me up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so Mayor, you had talked about you know the you know the enterprise fund uh, component and that type of thing, and uh, so I go back to this idea too with that and with with this. Uh, there, there's a value, I think, you know, as we're looking at these things here and the, the ideas that Councilmember Carter and Delisandro, uh, Councilmember Delisandro wants us to look at. Um, I think there's something there to be said about looking at that in the context of that and providing these services because I think it just makes us a more uh, competitive city uh, that, that folks want to want to be at. Now, there's a cost associated with it, um, but I think there's a cost uh, associated with maybe not doing those things too. Um, you know, you know, uh, council member Coulter talks about values in terms of what we, uh, when we make decisions. And so I, I think we ought to maybe you know, have a look at that and, you know, maybe you heard, heard me say something that I, you know, I've, I've talked about in the past, but, um, maybe, maybe why not have a look at that? Council member Coulter. Well, thank you, Mayor. This actually ended up being a much better segue into something I was going to wait on a little bit because I, I did some quick math um, and just just with golf, big, BCA, and aquatics, I added up with those four enterprise funds, it ended up being about $1.75 million in property tax support, which is roughly, it's just over 2.5% of our 2022 levy. And really that, I mean, that I think to me, it just got me thinking about, um, and I, I 
guess I should use the line while I'm still on the council, right? Like, <laughs> I'm not going to be around for much longer, but budget decisions are policy decisions, right? And, you know, I, I think maybe one of the ways we need to think about it is, you know, that's a, that's, you know, 2.56% of our property tax levy. Is that, I mean, are, is that the policy decision that we're making? That, that is a, that a certain percentage of our property taxes are just going to go to these enterprise funds and fund these other priorities. And, and I don't know, I don't know that we've ever really talked about it that way before. Um, but that maybe is the way we need to talk about it, both, you know, in terms of the, the deliberations that the seven of us have, um, but also in terms of how we talk about it to the community. So um, just wanted to, to raise that issue as something to think about. I think that's a, a very good point, Council Member. I, I came up with 1.9 million, but I must have, my math must have been off somewhere. But yeah, it's, it's a significant portion of money. And then it goes into, um, I, I think this segues nicely into many of the phone calls that a lot, of, a lot of us have received about organics recycling. Well, why should I have to pay for organics recycling? Well, because it's best for the community. Why should I have to pay for the aquatic center? Because it's best for the community. Why should I have to pay for recreational programs that many families use as childcare? Because it's best for the community. This is what we've decided our, our, our values and our priorities within our community. And this is, yes, budget decisions are our value decisions, priorities. Interesting way of thinking about it. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you. Getting back to numbers. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I don't need this tonight or uh, anytime soon, really, but I think it'd be nice to look at those programs that uh, families are struggling, uh, that we sell out in two minutes uh, with. You know, uh, my kids are a little bit older now, but we did a lot of summer programming with them uh, at various places. And what I just like to know is, you know, uh, look at those, take that out of the entire budget. What are the revenues? What are the expenses? How do we make it affordable for those families that need it? How do we charge a fair rate for those families that are have the ability to pay that fair rate um, so that we can meet the entire needs of the community like it, it, the mayor talked about doing that as kind of or maybe the city manager about that as part of a work plan I think that would be very interesting <laughs> I would love to see that because I think it is important to have those opportunities and I frankly don't think it's going to be an entirely a cost I mean because it does drive revenue if we if we charge for it properly, we price it properly and, and make it uh, there for people. Um, but what one of the things I would think, um, and I really thought we saw this in the past, um, is breaking out this budget between the Family Aquatic Center and the beach, so that we really understood, you know, what revenues were in which area and which rev and expenses so that we understood the difference between them. And maybe I totally missed that somewhere. I thought we broke it down uh, in one of the charts. It was yeah, we broke, broke it down. down on revenue, but we didn't on the expense side here. Um, that's and, and so, I, I mean, I, and I don't want to make assumptions, but my assumption is like a lot of the salaries and benefits are at the aquatic center since we don't have lifeguards and, and people attending the parking and things of that nature. Um, I'm assuming a lot of the capital outlay is at the aquatic center. I, I'm sure there are some costs over at the beach, but you know, the beach seems to just kind of be there. So last time I checked, <laughs> so, so I, it would, that's just what, it, just so we have a full realistic picture of these and, uh, the various portions of it. Um, because we do have significant taxpayer investment into these, and they're both very, these are clearly facilities that the community has said that they support and value, and I don't, I don't think that's a problem. So I don't want anybody to misconstrue what I'm saying. It would just give a better understanding in terms of what we might do in terms of programs, in terms of investments, in terms of those types of things. Mayor, Councilmember Nelson, council members, I do just want to let you know that at the end of this year, we have been working on business plans for each of our programs, so the expenses and revenues are split out per program, and we would be able to provide that to you. Thanks. Council, anything additional? This has uh, been a, a good and wide-ranging conversation, but I think it's, it's a worthwhile one to have. Anything additional on this? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
So next we have community services with uh, Diane Kirby. Good evening, Ms. Kirby. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Diane Kirby. I'm Director of Community Services for the City of Bloomington. Um, we're going to take a look at the Community Services Department tonight and talk about the budget requests for our divisions within the department. Um, taking a look at the uh, department overview, for those not familiar that are watching tonight, who are not familiar with the Community Services Department. Our mission is to inform, engage, and strive to enhance people's lives in the community. And I think this department certainly did that over the past two and a half years during the COVID pandemic. Our, vac our public health division provided vaccine clinics to protect our community. There was frequent communication via our digital and print media on how the residents could protect themselves, led by our communications division. And our community outreach and engagement division sponsored drive-through events and meetings with community partners and residents and stakeholders that they facilitated. So we're gonna take a closer look at the community services department right now. And by the way, our division managers are standing by online to answer any budget questions that you may have that I cannot answer. So we're going to start first with uh, Community Services Administration. There are two employees located in the Administration Division, myself and an administrative assistant. Our 2023 budget request is $394,000. Uh, the administration division oversees general administration of the department's divisions and staff development. We also coordinate the National Community Survey, our annual resident survey. In addition, we're involved in organizational development efforts for the city, including administering the Insights Discovery Tool for individual and team development. And this past year, we were actively involved in coordinating the BTT strategic planning process. Moving on to our Community Outreach and Engagement Division, there are six employees in our co-ed division, including five full-time and one part-time staff member. Uh, the 2023 budget request for this division is approximately $1.1 million. Now, the division's motto is involving community, influencing greatness, and co-ed does that by providing expertise and support on best practices in relationship building, community engagement, and public participation to every department in the city. The team also seeks out ways that every person who lives, works, learns, plays, or prays in Bloomington can connect with our staff and together create opportunities for programs and services that benefit the entire community. COED also leads citywide initiatives, including the Bloomington Leadership Program, and you heard from several members of our 2022 cohort last week our Veterans Appreciation Event, which we also sponsored this past week, a volunteer appreciation event, um, the, and a pride event, and it also supports your boards and commissions. And our co-ed staff are more than just event planners. They are also responsible for building meaningful connections with Bloomington community members and engaging them in our local government. Next, moving on to our largest division in Community Services Department, that's our Public Health Division. There are 51 staff in public health that equate to 38 FTE. Not counted in the staffing numbers are two full-time public health core members who are currently working at no cost to the city of Bloomington. The 2023 budget request for public health is $7.45 million. This includes the benefits that public health provides via its WIC program, that Women, Infant, and Children program, to clients in the community, which is well over a million dollars, which in turn is money that is directly invested into our local economy. Public health provides health services across the cities of Bloomington, Edina, and Richfield. This is a partnership that has been in place for 45 years, since 1977. Last year, public health served more than 26,000 individuals, including 10,000 who received COVID-19 vaccines. Clients receiving other direct services are primarily young children, new parents, and older adults. There are also disproportionately people with lower incomes and individuals from BIPOC communities. Example of public health services include the Maternal Early Childhood Sustained Home Visiting Program, policy work and initiatives to prevent tobacco use among youth, youth, use among youth our Peer Breastfeeding Counselor Program, the Women, Infant, and Children Supplemental Nutrition Program, and services for older adults and much, much more. 
Taking a look at our communications division, there are 10 employees, including eight full-time and two part-time staff in communications. The budget request for this division is approximately $2 million next year. Communications is a full service shop that uses multiple communications vehicles de dedicated to educating and informing our community. The division cablecasts and webcasts city council and other meetings, as you well know, produces the council minute, Bloomington Today and Discover Bloomington and other videos, maintains the city's websites and social media, operates public access television and generates the monthly briefing newsletter. The communications division is funded by franchise and peg fees received from cable companies who provide cable service in the city. And that cable company is Comcast. And then finally, our support services, which is overseen by the communications division. There are five part-time employees in this area. The 2023 budget request for this area is approximately $525,000. The city's print shop, mail room, and information desk provide services to all departments throughout the city of Bloomington, and these services are supported by user fees to departments based on usage. So let's take a closer look now at the budgets located in the community services department, and we'll start with those budgets that are located in the general fund. Community services administration, co-ed, and public health are located in the general fund. The total budget request for 2023 here for these divisions is $8.96 million. Now that's an increase you probably noticed of $1.2 million from 2022. There are several factors driving this particular budget increase. The main driver is in public health where overall expenses are increasing by $1.041 million and overall revenues are also growing by $800,000. So there's a one-time grant funding of $700,000 from Medina and Ridgefield for COVID response and recovery efforts. This expense is for professional services and staffing, and it's offset with matching revenues. So the net effect to the city is zero. There's also 886, or I'm sorry, there's also $86,000 budgeted for a community health worker position funded by the American Rescue Plan that was a budget adjustment in 2022. Therefore, it's not included in the 2022 base budget that you see here. Uh, salary and benefits increases for public health staff equal uh, roughly $200,000 and internal charges for public health increased by $81,000. And I wanted to give you a, a more detailed look at the funding sources for public health. Public health receives the majority of its revenues from sources outside of property taxes. In fact, property taxes in 2023 make up just 24% of public health revenues. And the division will receive 71% of its revenues from grants and contracts next year. Most of these grants and contracts are stable funding streams. And other sources of revenues include things like insurance reimbursements and fees. Our communications division is located in the special revenue fund since the bulk of its revenues come from the cable television franchise fees. We expect expenditures to increase by 5% next year by $117,000 to $2 million. Primary drivers in this budget increase are legal fees for the cable television franchise renewal process and a strategic planning consultant, both of which I will expand upon in just a couple of minutes. More than two thirds of the funding for communication comes from cable television franchise and peg fees totaling $1.3 million. $400,000 comes from property taxes that began when the city expanded the briefing from an every other month to a monthly newsletter. Other income sources include fees from services provided internally and externally and transfers into the budget. And here is the, uh, we'll talk about the long-term model in a minute, but I wanted to show you, and I thought it would be helpful for you to see what's happening with the fees from Comcast. This chart shows cable television franchise revenue since the current contract with Comcast was approved back in 2015. As a reminder, the city receives franchise fees of 5% of gross revenues from our cable company. That's noted in the blue bars. And as you can see, we hit a high point in cable television franchise fees in 2017 of $1.16 million. By contrast, the franchise fees the city received in 2021 totaled approximately $1.05 million, a decrease of approximately $114,000 over those intervening years. 
The city also receives a PEG fee, as noted in the orange bars. PEG stands for Public Education and Government Cable Television Access. This PEG fee must be used to pay for capital expenses in our PEG access operations. Compact Cast collects a fee of $1.40 per subscriber per month that it remits to the city in support of PEG capital expenses. And it is this fee that really tells a story about where things have been going with cable television subscribership in Bloomington. The revenues from that fee have dropped from a high of $336,000 in 2017 down to $256,000 in 2021, down $80,000. So we see this as a movement toward core cutting that I think we're seeing across the country right now. It's part of a national trend. And this is a look at the long-term funding model for communications. And as I just mentioned, the area we are paying the closest attention to right now is the fees that we are receiving from Comcast. Uh, the budget for our support services operations of the mailroom, info desk, and print shop are in the internal service fund. And as you can see, there's a proposed $2,800 increase in that budget from 2022. Looking ahead, we expect support services working capital balance to stay in the black through 2025 with a dip in the red expected in, in 2026, which we'll be looking at more closely in the future budgets in an effort to minimize that impact. So as we look out into the future, we have challenges and initiatives in our divisions that we will be addressing next budget year and in future years. Looking at communications, the cable television franchise agreement with Comcast expires in December of 2025. Starting next year, the city will begin a three-year franchise renewal process that will involve a needs assessment, technical review of Comcast's cable television system in the city, a survey, audit, and working with outside legal counsel on our negotiations with the cable provider. Also, Communications is in the process of formulating a strategic plan to guide its digital communications, including social media, email marketing, and the city's website. I've seen some of the preliminary findings from this particular planning process. It's very interesting. I think you will be intrigued by what the consultant has come up with. And we have selected a consultant for a public relations strategic planning process. This is something I know the City Council has been very interested in pursuing. This PR plan will guide communications and public relations priorities of the City Council and provide direction for the City's public relations activities to enhance our community image. The plan would also support the new Bloomington Tomorrow Together strategic plan, and work will start on that plan at the beginning of next year. In public health, we've been discussing for more than a decade that public health's building is in dire need of replacement for both of the employees who work there as well as the clients that we serve out of that building on a regular basis. This is something that was identified in the racial equity business plan as well as other assessment work, and now we need a path forward. Funding was in last year's legislative bonding bill and in the legislative proposal for a new community health and wellness center funded by a local option sales tax that was looked at this past year. And right now we're exploring both short-term and long-term options going forward. This next point, healthcare continues to be in an almost crisis state uh, with little capacity impacting our routine care. So clients are negatively impacted by making their health worse. And then finally, in June of 2019, a framework to transform how Minnesota does local public health was produced by the State Community Health Services Advisory Committee. Councilmember Carter is a member of this particular group. That framework includes a plan for updating 145A, the Local Public Health Act written in 1976 that would reflect the realities of modern public health. That work was delayed by COVID. It's restarting with lessons learned from the pandemic. The goal is to ensure all residents in Minnesota have access to the same foundational public health and that is resourced sufficiently. This is not happening currently in terms of resources being put into public health. And a lot of work is going into understanding how many additional staff are needed to do the work, how to pay for that, and who should pay for it. In other states, that's been a state-assumed responsibility, and this work is critical to addressing the, the racial disparities that we see in health. 
finally, in community outreach and engagement, the city is, we've identified missing out on opportunities for residents to fully participate and give back to their community by not having a full-time volunteer coordinator. The level of integration, support, and management needed necessitates a staff position that can support departments with current opportunities, oversee reporting requirements, and engage more of the public in new and meaningful opportunities to give back to the city. And we will be exploring the possibility of integrating a volunteer coordinator position into future budgets. And so that is an overview of the Community Services Department. And I will stand for questions. Thank you very much. Council questions. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple quick ones here. In public health, uh, you indicated there was um, some grant funding uh, that covered a lot of the costs. Just wanted to make sure I understood the information we received before that that's a temporary expense that we're going to have, right. that it's not creating a structural deficit going forward. Is that right? That is correct, particularly with that contract with Edina and Ridgefield on COVID response. Okay. That is a one year okay. agreement. Thank you. And just wanted to clarify that. Um, do we have any sense of what the cost to review and negotiate with the cable companies with regards to the trend? Uh, uh, I totally forgot the word. Franchise fees. Franchise fees. That's not transit, it's franchise fees. So um, what that might cost might be? I would say based on, of course, past experience was back in the 2013-14 time frame when we uh, renewed that contract in early January of 2015 and of course it's been it's been a while since we've done that um, my guess is it will be somewhere in the could be thirty to fifty thousand dollar range between our legal costs that we do have a telecommunications uh, legal advisor who does assist us with that franchise negotiation we will be doing some audits we will be doing survey work um, there's quite a bit of work involved in terms of when it comes to renegotiating a cable franchise agreement. And just from my understanding, that is not in the 2023 budget, is that? There is money that is starting to be budgeted in the 2023 budget in communications. Okay. Um, so the reason I bring that up, Mayor, is as, as I've said before, and I believe you have as well, I think we needed further conversation about whether or not we just bring that back into the general fund and eliminate the franchise fees. Um, if it, I mean, if having the franchise fees is going to cost us thirty to fifty thousand dollars, you know, it's not a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars, but it, you know, it's something. It's not nothing. Um, uh, last time I had, uh, so we're look. You're looking at hiring a consultant to do a strategic plan um, for the PR and communication. Is right. that right? Is that That's in this right. budget? That is in the budget for 2023. 2023. Um, why aren't we looking at that doing doing that internally? I, I remember I sat in on the public health strategic plan, and I believe that was all done internally. With um, we, have, my understanding is, we have a number of people trained uh, within the organization that can facilitate that type type of thing. And and so, why are we looking at an outside consultant to do that? Uh, Mayor and City Council. I, we felt it was very important. We knew that this was a priority of the city council. We have heard from each one of you, particularly during, throughout the strategic planning process, that this was very important as it related to Bloomington's public image. And we felt it was important to get outside technical assistance on doing that strategic planning process. Uh, the person we have hi hired has a lot of experience working with local governments and strategic planning around public relations and communications and will bring technical expertise that uh, we don't necessarily have in-house. Just one last question. What is the cost of that? That cost was approximately $26,000. Thank you. Councilmember Martin and Councilmember Coulter. Councilmember Martin. Thank you. Uh, and just one more question on that process. So on the back end of that, is that uh, strategic planning about um, the way we want to present city initiatives, uh, the uh, kind of how, what, what Bo we're putting on our package, uh, or is that um, building internal staff capacity to, to go out boots on the ground, knock on doors, send press releases, 
Um, or is that capability we're going to need to develop after we know what color the bow is going to be on the yeah. package, if that makes sense? I, that does make sense, uh, Mayor and City Council. It, it will be, I think, primarily around the how do we do public relations, and then, as you mentioned, the resourcing for it. Okay. You know, are we going to need to look at doing things a little bit differently than we are right now in order to really focus in on PR and PR in a you know, local region as well as nationally? Okay. Thank you very much. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and forgive me if you don't, you know, I don't know if you have this information on hand, but um, it was not long after, I, th I think it's been about five years now, I think it was not long after I got sworn in council that we moved to the, the brief, we moved the briefing to yeah. every month. Do you know offhand approximately how much more that costs to do it once a month versus once every other month? Mayor and City Council, I don't know the exact cost. Now, we did hire a part-time communication specialist several years ago. That was part of what was driving the increased cost to do a monthly briefing. We just didn't have the capacity in-house to publish it on a monthly basis. Um, I don't know the exact cost because there's also the cost of printing and mailing. So don't know the exact cost, um, but we can get that number to you. Oh, yeah, I think I think that would be helpful. And I, I think, you know, to... to sort of both the point that, that Councilmember Nelson was making and the, the discussion that we had earlier, you know, we we're talking about $400,000 and, and an increase, increasing from there in terms of property tax support for communications. I mean, I, you know, again, I think this is sort of a, a budget decision to our policy decisions. I mean, I, we, all the time we hear from folks about how valuable they consider the briefing to be, how many folks get information from it, appreciate that they get, that they get it every month. And so, mm -hmm. Um, I think that's, you know, that's just sort of a piece we need to really consider is, you know, with this discussion of franchise fees and, you know, they, it looks like they, looks like they went up a tiny bit in yeah. 2021, but now they're, they're likely dropping down again in 2022. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think that number is going to go up again, right. at least not significantly. Right. And so, um, I think in, in the not too distant future, there's probably going to have to be a conversation of, about the, really the future of franchise fees and, um, I think that's sort of the kind of the value proposition that I think we're going to need to be considering. So. Uh, Mayor and Council, we do have Communications Administrator Janine Hill on the line. I'm going to check with her very quickly. Janine, if you have any additional information about the increase in costs for briefing production in the last couple of years. Good evening, Council Member Coulter and Mayor and Council Members. Um, Yes, we did because of, we used to publish the briefing six times a year and we went to 12 times a year. So it did in fact double the cost for printing and mailing. And that cost was, I believe $70,000. And Diane mentioned that we hired a part-time writer to assist. We kept our, our graphic designer. So he's doing all of the, the work monthly, uh, but we did need an additional writer to keep up with the, um, call for story ideas and the production of the briefing um, to um, uh, that. And that kind of rounds out. I, I can't, I, I, I think it might be around $30,000 additional. So what I'm, what I'm hearing just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly is it's an, an additional approximately $70,000 in printing and mailing. And then the $30,000 approximately um, for that, that part-time position. So it, an additional cost of approximately $100,000. Am I understanding that correctly and roughly in the ballpark? Yes, that is yeah. correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Verbrugge? Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Actually, I uh, was going to respond to something Council Member Nelson had brought up, and then I see he stepped away. Um, so he'll just have to see it on the tape later. Um, <laughs> the the, the um, uh, thought about just bringing the communications into the general fund rather than having its own fund. You know, one of the things that we have to be uh, pretty uh, considerate of is the connection between the franchise fees and what those fees are being allocated towards because it is part of the franchise agreement. And so to the same extent that we um, spend a fair amount of effort monitoring the activity of our um, franchisee, uh, Comcast to make sure that they are in compliance with the franchise, they do the same thing with us, right? So if, if there starts to be a lack of um, 
uh, clarity about how we are utilizing those franchise fees. Say it's being allocated in other places because it's just being sort of lost into the larger general fund. Um, it could open us up to a, an audit from Comcast. Uh, so we, that's why we keep this in a separate fund. I think the obvious point is that taxpayer support for communications is going to increase as the franchise fees inevitably either stall out or decline. Um, but moving it into the general fund is probably not something that we would want to do just for that um, legality purpose related to the franchise itself. Thank you for that clarification. Councilmember Nelson, I hope you heard a majority of that. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just uh, real uh, briefly, I, I'd be curious down the line to get some additional information on media organizations that are relying on franchise fees in the region but cover multiple communities. And if that's as simple of a structure as what I uh, picture our, our public health department and kind of pooling those resources and pooling those fees, or if because they're tied to very specific work uh, and the oversight, if it's more complicated than that. But I, I know there are media, local media organizations that cover multiple communities and rely on franchise fees as well. So I'm just curious how all those streams tie together and if it's something we'd look at longer term. And I, I could be I could be wrong on the details there, but yeah. All right, thank you. Councilmember Lohman. Um, <clears throat> uh, maybe more just comments. Uh, uh, so from the public health, uh, that building, we've got to get that, <laughs> I gotta get that thing fixed. Uh, it, it's really, really a problem. Um, and so I appreciate that uh, you've brought that forward again. And I, uh, uh, you know, we had originally tried to put that into the, um, the renewed community center. And I'm just hoping that we will find a, a place to, to, to get that done. I just think that uh, it's kind of embarrassing how old that, that building is, Mayor. <laughs> and uh, if there's any way that we can, you know, move that along, I'd, I'd love to see that. Um, uh, moved as soon as possible. Um, and then secondarily, uh, I also think that, uh, you know, I've seen many a times where we had our, um, our, our volunteer recognition and uh, just how many um, uh, people in the city uh, are just looking for a place to, to, to plug in uh, and, and be there in the community. And I, I just do think that, uh, you know, this idea of having a volunteer coordinator, even with what we dealt with with the Sustainability Commission, uh, there's so many uh, resources that are kind of left on the table uh, because there just isn't that person to kind of help drive that. So I just think that, uh, uh, that that is also a very good idea, and I hope to see that uh, kind of moving forward. And then, and then finally, with the uh, franchise fees, I, I do hope that there is some kind of future, you know, maybe some act of Congress or maybe something even at the state level, maybe somebody is here could help us to try to help, you know, identify additional resources with respect to uh, those cord cutting that's this taking place because you know people are certainly watching stuff uh, I, I don't have cable myself uh, you know the, the former uh, uh, TV piece of it um, uh, but uh, so I'm a cord cutter as well so I, I can see the end is near <laughs> so uh, thank you for your work and thank you for this presentation agree council member I mean the the notion of a, a fee based on cable television subscriptions and funding significant uh, city programming uh, is very 1970s, very archaic, and it needs to change in some way, shape, or form, but I couldn't tell you what, how to change it right now, so, but I agreed. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Next, uh, we have two more departments to go through, so we have Finance Department and then Administration Department, so here's Finance Department, Lori economy Scholler. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Lori economy Shoulder, the Chief Financial Officer for the City of Bloomington. I'm here to go through the Finance Department budget and our insurance budget. So first up is the Finance Department's preliminary request. And in that, um, Majority of our costs are in the salary and benefits. In materials and supplies, we're looking for approximately a $4,000 increase, of, of which about $2,500 is the cost to pay for our local option sales tax report each year. Um, so that is majority of the increase in the supplies and materials. In our in the chargeback area, 
Uh, our department, um, we have utility billing and risk management. Those full areas um, charge back their cost. So like risk management would charge back their entire um, cost of first services um, that we split with legal. Um, but the finance piece goes to the um, insurance fund. And the six people that we have that are in utility billing, uh, all of their costs are moved to the four utility funds. So, um, and then we have a couple other chargeback areas where we take some of our services, like payroll and pieces like that, and charge to other funds because they do incur uh, payroll-related activities, purchasing-related activities, those type of things. So that's where our chargeback areas are at. We have 27 full-time staff, and the, these, um, our staff work in areas for accounting, accounts payable, receivable, um, audit, um, budgeting, uh, cash receipting, cash management, um, the debt service, grants, investments, payroll, um, utility billing, um, risk management, and purchasing. So finance uh, mission, main mission is to protect the city's assets. To protect those assets, we work collaboratively with departments to educate them on government accounting standards, audit requirements, industry best practices. We offer training um, on finance policies and procedures. Um, we've included in um, 2022 um, some videos also on training um, that have helped a lot of departments work through some of the, their processes. We work closely with IT um, to maintain, test, and upgrade our finance ERP software and our utility billing software. Uh, we have received the GFOA Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for 50 years, and we celebrated this, that this summer with the City Council. We are only two cities in the entire country that have earned this honor. The other is Oak Ridge, Tennessee, with 60 and another county. We are also a AAA-rated city from Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and Fitch. Um, you know, the emphasis would be we are one of only 33 municipal governments of more than 19,500 nationwide that have that honor. And as um, one of our earlier pieces this summer is uh, we had um, a, a, video, a small video wearing crowns, um, and that was to emphasize the GFOA's uh, Awards for Excellence, we have received, again, that financial report for t over 50 years, our popular report for our corporate report, which is with the briefing um, in the June report each year for uh, 23 years, and our budget report uh, for 27 years. And then for the first time in 2021, we also had an award for excellence in government finance um, in budget engagement, and that featured Kari Carlson and... Um, a lot of the CBAC activities that we did that summer. So in the insurance fund, um, this covers, let's see, there we go, workers' compensation, general liability, automobile, and property are the four types. In that budget, and for 2023, our, our current revenues that we are budgeting is 2,251,000, and what we're the expense for 2023 that we are looking for is 2.5 million. So we would be using fund balance or reserves for $330,000, um, bringing down our fund balance, um, keeping the the fund balance and the charges to departments um, on the lower side. Uh, it looks like we are also going to be in the, the slight uh, yellow range um, where we're watching in 2024, and we would be back up in 2025 at 104%. Some of the initiatives in 2022, um, moving into 2023, we um, focused a lot on financial policies. Um, and one of the other areas is grant um, administration. Um, we have a new grant policy coming to the city council on the 5th of December. Uh, there was a micro business of many um, grant users in the city that worked together to, with our finance um, grant uh, accountant to prepare this policy. So it's um, the buy-in is citywide on this policy. Next year, they will create the 
procedures and the training for all of that. Um, there has been a tremendous amount of um, work in that area and a lot of grants are still being applied for as we're going through more and more each, um, as we're approaching and have received the grant accountant this year, it's amazing um, how people um, now use Janet as a resource as they're applying for it. Um, so she's in constant contact with them. Um, there is a lot of, um, I would say, very strict documentation and reporting requirements for the federal dollars. Um, we had the safer, excuse me, the, um, yeah, not the safer, the CARES money first, the ARP money um, is now under consideration and a lot of reporting is going on every quarter for that. Um, Janet has already created um, files with about 10 different um, resources that are adhering to the very strict requirements that the SAFER grant will need um, moving forward. So that I'm sure at some point we'll be audited on any one of these and we wanna make sure as we are protecting the assets of the city, we have all that documentation in place and ready to go as soon as we know we're gonna be audited. So um, new policies and procedures and training um, to make sure that there is consistency. I mean, that was one of the main goals here, consistency of applications, how we apply for grants, how we monitor grants, and how we uh, stay in compliance with them. So uh, again, um, the, the next piece would be supplier diversity. Our purchasing agent was before the council last uh, Monday discussing um, the diversity program and just shifting from now that um, the Strong and Starlight um, report is in and you've been able to look through that. Preliminary work in 23 will be a guide on how to do business with the city, forecasting um, project opportunities, and prompt payment for um, policies for small businesses. Um, also before the council, other initiatives um, that we'll do in 2023 is you have had a number of policies come before you this uh, last couple of months on uh, travel, training, mileage. Um, updated procedures on that will happen with, um, and Jamie will review those, and then we'll make sure that there's updated training on all of those for, from the council members on down on how to do all that pa paperwork. Because we, as a finance department, protect the assets of the city. <laughs> so I'm open for questions if you have any. Thank you. Council discussion, questions on the finance budget? Councilmember Member Loman. Well, we got to say something about all those awards we won. <laughs> <laughs> We're good. It's a big night tonight, so we can move on to the next one if you don't have questions. <laughs> Thank you. Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, yes, just with one one quick question, um, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, the uh, the grant position is is now. Is that a new position? It's not a new position. That was a new position in 2022, correct? Correct. And that, that we, we have, can we're going to continue to fund that, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, I'm, I've, I have not heard anybody talking about what we plan to go after as it relates to the Inflation Reduction Act, but since there's so much sustainability and, and environmental uh, infrastructure benefit in that grant, I was just kind of curious if, if that's something that we can bring forward at a future meeting, and I'm assuming that our grants person is looking into that. Uh, so if I'm, if I'm not right about that, let me know, but um, just wanted to put that on the radar for future consideration. I know that they are funding stuff already through that program, so. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member D'Alessandro, it's an excellent question. Uh, and let me just go um, backwards a little bit. So when we discussed this position during the last budget uh, season, I, I know Council Member D'Alessandro, you weren't on the council. I know you were paying attention. Um, we talked about uh, finding a unicorn, and that's somebody who can do the compliance and reporting uh, of grant management and also being somebody who can assist with grant writing and identifying grant opportunities. And I think that we did uh, a good job of finding a unicorn. As, as Lori said, Janet is um, exceedingly competent. Um, it, and now it's a capacity issue because I, her entire first six months with us have been really um, focused on um, building the, the reporting and compliance structure here. And so there hasn't been as much attention focused on the going out and pursuing um, grants. Specific to the Inflation Reduction Act, um, two issues there. Uh, one is that um, there is a lot of money there, and it is not at all clear yet um, how uh, cities will access 
those resources or what the um, process is going to be for releasing those funds uh, at the federal or state or local levels. And so we continue to work with um, the League of Minnesota Cities and um, Municipal Legislative Commission um, as our lobbyists and uh, intergovernmental representatives are tracking that constantly. And our staff is in regular communication with them uh, to understand how that process will re uh, roll out. And as we see those opportunities, we're certainly going to go after them. Just to just to add to that, the guidance to how to use those funds and how to report those funds and um, is not yet available. Um, so similar to CARES money, where the guidance started in um, almost weekly or monthly, they were doing updates. I would suspect once um, they put their first guidance out, um, those would be updated too. But um, guiding guidance of what to do and how to do it with those funds is not available. Thank you. Thank you much. Last department is administration, Mike Sable. Mr. Sable, last but not least. Thank you for that, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Mike Sable, Assistant City Manager. Um, we're going to talk today about the administration department, which is really four functional areas. One, the City Manager's Office and the City Council, the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, Human Resources in the City Clerk's Office, and I'm joined by Christina Scipioni and Faith Jackson on the phone, so they will kind of cover their sections. And um, uh, Next slide, please. Oh, I've got it. As again, as I said, these are the kind of the four functional areas within the admin department. Oh, gotcha. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, this, we're this deep in. Nobody's got it. <laughs> so at, at a very high level, you can see that the, uh, the, uh, the, the functional areas of those, those go up $456,000 over the 2022 uh, budget as it's proposed. Uh, the, mo nearly half of that is within salaries, which is the general wage adjustments that you would see. I think the other thing that I would point out is that services have gone up. Uh, significantly from 2023 over 2022, and I wanted to kind of lay out some of the some of the differences for that changes. One of them is in administrative services around of elections. Uh, so we've had a placeholder for $85,000 in the in, in the off chance that we will have to have a special election in 2023 to, to potentially for ranked choice voting. We don't know the outcome of that, but we do want to be prepared if that is an eventuality. We also have set aside $60,000 for professional services to help us develop a more robust performance management system, uh, a dashboard that the community and the city council can look at, consistent with uh, the city's uh, Bloomington Tomorrow Together plan, again, cultivating an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. Uh, the other component that we have in there is $40,000 dedicated for racial equity and inclusion training for staff. Uh, as we know that, you know, the as Faith will talk about later, this is a, an important investment as our community changes and the demographics of the city of Bloomington shift and having a staff prepared to, to meet that changing demographic is an important piece. Uh, and then we also have done, uh, we've set aside $30,000 to uh, modernize our performance evaluation system for staff. Um, I will say that it, we currently do many of them on paper still in PDF format. And so having a, a mechanism, an online training system for developing our employees is the surest um, way to uh, make sure that we're prepared to meet the uh, changing needs of the community and actually having a staff that's able and ready to, um, to grow along with the community. Uh, the city manager's office does have four full-time employees, one part-time employee, and then the seven uh, elected members here in the budget request, is, as you find out. And so this, this number does not change significantly over time except for salary adjustments. Um, but it does also include some consulting services for strategic planning and those items that the city council may want to have in there. It also includes memberships in um, National League of Cities, League of Cities, other sort of uh, entities and, and um, things that the city council uses. Faith, I will give you time to unmute and we will talk about the Office of Racial Equity and Inclusion and Belonging and the floor is yours if you can hear me. I can hear you, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Awesome. 
So here on the screen is some information about the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. Uh, traditionally, in a presentation like this, we will be talking about the racial equity coordinator as a single person, but it's cited uh, this year that we actually develop an office that will be able to sustain and grow the equity and inclusion work. And so I think that's something we can be incredibly proud of. Um, there are a few bullet points on here that talk about the work that we do. Uh, I won't read through them all, but I, what I'll say is that the work that we do is both internal and external. Uh, over the last few years, we focus a lot on the internal work, like the racial equity business plan um, and, and doing the racial equity action teams and things like that. Uh, but as we've been able to acquire additional capacity, we've been able to expand beyond the internal and doing more external work. And that's something that we hope to do more of in 2023. Uh, a few members of the council, Council Bologna and Council Loman, are on the Welcome to Bloomington Advisory Committee. And so uh, that is just sort of one example of the sort of additional external work that we're doing. Um, and that also that sort of accounts for uh, some of the budget requests for this year, being able to sustain programs like that so that we can really be intentional about an embedding racial equity inclusion belonging in both everything within the culture and climate of the organization as an internal entity and also really sustaining that work um, with the broader community. The, the other thing that I will highlight is just recognizing that investing in this work uh, it really improves individual lives and it generates this broad community benefits. And so from a um, workforce culture perspective, we all know and you've heard me say <laughs> time after time about how sort of having a diverse workforce and an inclusive culture not only attracts people to the organization, it helps make sure that they stay there, right? And so it's important from that perspective. Uh, but we also know that racial disparities cause uh, an estimated $250 billion to the state of Minnesota every year. And so the work that our office is doing both in workforce development initiatives and also the supply of diversity initiatives that we support also really helped, uh, also really help um, from an economic development standpoint and helps to contribute to that place as well. And so with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Council, any questions of Ms. Jackson regarding the Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion and Belonging? I love when I leave you speechless, so I will <laughs> turn it over to Christina. So as Christina gets ready to unmute, I do want to talk a little bit about human resources, which is the other largest, uh, uh, one of the larger pieces in it. Human resources does have six full-time employees and one part-time employee, and they really do coordinate staffing, recruitment, and hiring, and all of the uh, back-end office functions that you would expect of a human resources department. Um, this is a group that has... Um, uh, does really good work. We really try to be the best employer in our recruitment and retention of employees. And there is a slide later on that would ask, it would show uh, an increase and ask for one additional FTE to help with some uh, volume issues. And, and as I've heard, a theme throughout earlier part of the night is the challenge of, of, of recruiting and retaining staff and including finding the right salary structure and salary mix. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Christina to talk about the city clerk's office. Hello, Mayor and City Council. As you know, I'm Christina Scipioni. I am the City Clerk. Um, the City Clerk's Office has a variety of different activities um, that we provide. Uh, elections, business licensing, a passport acceptance agent facility, data governance for all of our city records, and general data requests. Um, a lot of what can drive the City Clerk's budget are how many elections we are um, running in any given year. Um, so our even numbered years, we run the federal, state, and county elections, and then the city and school district elections are held in odd numbered years. And so there are fluctuations in our budget just based upon how much staff we're hiring to run those, help us run those elections. Um, we also maintain the records and provide sales for the Bloomington City Cemetery, um, which is accounted for in the Cemetery Special Revenue Fund. Um, to give you kind of a scope of what we do, I know elections is one of the more high profile pieces of what we do, but we also serve um, at least 70 um, passport appointments a week. And we typically see about 70 um, walk-in um, customers a week for licensing, for passports, um, or for other aspects of our business. Um, so we're one of the busier counters at City Hall um, and see a lot, of, a lot of members of the public on a fairly regular basis. 
And you answer questions if there are questions specific to the clerk's office. Okay. Questions regarding the clerk's office. Hmm? Ms. Scipioni. Very good. Uh, the next component within the budget is, is related to our internal service funds, the Employee Benefits and Accrued Benefits Fund. And this really, um, it's a set fee that we set for employees to sort of pay for operating budgets to, to fund health insurance, dental, life insurance, the traditional insurance package that you would see. Um, I work very closely with Kari Carlson and the, and the finance team and sort of figuring out what this uh, employee benefits charge out for each employee is. It's been uh, $17,510 per employee, which has been uh, remarkably consistent over the uh, last two years. But this is a, a component that really functions as almost like a chargeback so each department can measure the true cost of delivering their service. Uh, and I don't know if, Kari, if you want to mention anything about the employee benefits fund. Here's the long-term model, and uh, it is the working capital balance is in line with the goal that we have for this fund. Part of the goal for this fund is to have uh, re reserves for at least a month of expenses, but also to have a reserve in here for um, in future years where we anticipate a huge spike in health insurance premiums. Um, we've been pretty fortunate that we were facing a really huge spike in health insurance premiums a couple years back. We ended up switching to PEEP for a while, so we were able to avoid that. And we've been fortunate with um, the health insurance premiums that we've received the uh, last couple years with our contracts and switching back to, to Medica. Um, but we do have that in there so that we don't have a huge spike um, in the department budgets, which would then impact property taxes. Um, but it's about $12 million in revenue. We do have some revenue that comes from employees that are also contributing to their health, life, insurance, um, dental, where that's being withheld from their paychecks, or retirees that are paying in. Um, that all comes in as revenue. The, the biggest source of revenue is department charges. And then the biggest source of expenses is the health insurance premiums that are shown on that medical line. And then uh, last, uh, we want to talk a little bit about focus areas. And Christina, if you uh, would be willing to talk about, um, oh, I'm sorry, accrued benefits. Yes, please. Okay. We're back to <laughs> um, the other internal service fund that goes along with um, administration. It's under human resources. So there's the employee benefits fund, which is the health insurance dental the accrued benefits fund is the fund that is used for um, accrued time off. So vacation, personal time, comp time. And if you recall from talking about this budget in past years, um, what, we sh what we show, it's a little different than the other funds outside the general fund. This, we're showing the total liability. So um, at the bottom there, we're showing uh, the current assets, basically the cash in this fund, compared to the ter total liabilities. And so as we've said before, the chances of us having to pay this out all at once, that would mean like the city closed down or all the employees left, we would have to pay this out, is very remote. So uh, we're, more, we're comfortable kind of keeping this right now, like around 80%. It is dipping a bit below that. Um, during COVID, um, we had the, the um, people's accrued balances did grow significantly. No one went anywhere. Um, so we really noticed that jump in, in 2020 as a liability. Um, but we do have a plan that we show our auditors when we show this long term out to 2033 of it being 100% funded. But, um, but overall, we're comfortable where, where this fund is. And it's funded by its... The revenues coming in from departments, it's 3.5% of the salaries of the employees for full-time employees and um, regular part-time employees that are you know, not seasonal but that are here consistently. So a question on that. Is the, is the goal to be 100% funded, is that the city's goal or is that the goal of the auditors? I mean, because there's the reality and then there's the actuarial goals that... Uh, we face every day? It would be, um, Mayor, uh, City Council members, it would be a, a best practice. Um, it would be like what the Office of the State Auditor would recommend and auditors, but they have been comfortable with us at this level with a plan of how we could eventually get closer. So I don't know if that answers your question. So, but the, but the, but the goal to go to 100% by 2030, whatever, 
that's that's something we're working toward based on we're not being mandated we're cho- we're choosing to do that is that correct yes mayor and council members it it is correct i will say it that it keeps getting pushed out <laughs> towards the- Mr. Verbrugge. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I, I would second what Kari said. It is, it is an achievable goal, and uh, it is a best practice uh, to achieve um, full funding. So. I'm sure it is, mm-hmm. but it's also kind of silly, I think. <laughs> Council, any questions, additional questions? Uh, so sorry to jump ahead, but Christina, I did want to give you another opportunity to talk about focus topics and uh, the role of uh, the passport counter. Thank you. Um, so one of uh, mayor and council, one of the requests that we had made in the city clerk's office um, for our 2023 budget that was not included um, was increased staffing for our um, our licensing and our passport acceptance um, operation that we have. And so currently um, we have two full-time licensing specialists and one part-time licensing specialist that provide the bulk of the service for our passport acceptance. Um, We have some election staff who also provide assistance when it's not election season. Um, And then we have one supervisor in that department who also provides backup assistance. But we run a very lean crew um, in our passport area and in our in our licensing area. And so we are proposing to, or we had proposed to increase that part-time licensing specialist to a full-time position, which adds 12 hours a week of capacity there. And then adding an additional part-time licensing specialist at 15 hours a week. So the total cost for that is right around 70,000 um, when you're talking um, wages and um, benefits. Uh, The benefits of this proposed change um, would be, A, it would allow us to provide additional passport appointments um, for an estimated increased revenue of about 50,000. So we could provide the opportunity for about 35 more appointments a week. Um, And so that offsets a lot of the cost for these additional positions. And so really this would cost us an additional 20,000 to provide those additional, that additional staff capacity. Um, Those additional hours also build capacity for our licensing staff to focus on more community inclusion efforts. Um, You saw a presentation from our um, racial equity action team earlier this year about our working toward providing more translated services um, in person, providing more translated licensing materials um, and licensing outreach activities. Um, But the reality is some of that is just functionally hard to do when you have a very small staff. Um, If you've got one person who may be covering a counter for a day because you have a couple other people out or on lunch and someone comes in and wants to apply for a business license and English is not their first language, it's very hard to step away from that counter to provide um, a translated um, service in a a conference room or somewhere that's um, that's quiet and is more conducive to providing that that service for our residents. And so... um, having that additional capacity provides additional space at our counter and it provides additional staff time to um, provide a higher level of service that we would like to provide. Um, It also provides for better coverage and more flexibility during times when staffing is limited. Um, So you all may remember an email you received um, a couple weeks ago when we were in the thick of things with elections, we had um, two members of our licensing staff who were um, out um and we're out ill and so we had to look at reducing our passport appointments um we've had to look at reducing passport appointments in the past um, because of decreased staffing levels if someone's out ill that takes away a third of our workforce for providing that passport coverage Um, and so our staff do the best that we can to always provide the same number of appointments every week Um, but sometimes the reality is we do have to decrease that and decrease that level of service and the level of revenues that we're receiving um, because we don't have, we just simply don't have the people, um, the capacity to provide as much service as we would like to, um, especially when unexpected um, illnesses and absences occur. And so providing those additional two people really increases the bandwidth um, for our division to meet the customer needs, not just for our scheduled passport appointments, but for those you know 70 additional customers that are walking in um, that we just have to be ready to serve whenever they whenever they happen to stop by and make sure we have the capacity to do that. 
Um, so again, that was not included in the 2023 um, preliminary budget, but it is still something that we are very much interested in providing um, in, in 2023. And again, the additional cost um, after you include the additional passport revenue is about 20,000. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about that request if council has any. Council questions, council member Carter, then council member Coulter, council member Carter. Thank you, mayor. Um, so and maybe this is a dumb question, but why was this not original? Why was this not in the 2023 preliminary budget? Um, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Carter, I think the shorter answer is, is there's a finite, uh, there's a fixed pool of resources, and we try to um, prioritize them differently. But um, if if there are opportunities for additional revenue enhancements or any other structural changes, I thought it was an important piece to talk about the need and the benefit that could happen. And I think. Um, you know, the, the recent example of having people get sick in the midst of having an election and having a thousand people a day come into the door, uh, I think it really um, identified for us a need to have, if we could find more capacity, that we would obviously try to ask for that. And so maybe I'll look to the city manager if, to see if he wants to add anything else. Um, so currently our times are 820 to 220. And I looked it up, but I also know this because I did recently get passports at the counter and it t it took me forever to get an appointment because there are such limited appointments and then the hours are not super conducive for people who have jobs during the day and then also um, have kids who need passports and have to miss school and all that kind of stuff so I guess I'm just curious in terms of kind of increasing accessibility for our community what would be the additional hours that the passport office would be open Council Member Car or Mayor Council Member Carter, thank you for that question. Uh, because of the timing of when we have to transmit those passport acceptance to um, the passport agency, we have to do that by the last mail of the day. And so we aren't able to expand our hours much more. We could go earlier, um, but there's a pretty hard cutoff at the end of the day because under the federal rules, we have to, all the work that we have done in that day has to be transmitted at the end of the day to the passport agency. And so um, given the last mail um, of, the, of the day and the time that that occurs, it's very difficult to add more appointments in the evening hours. Um, the plan would be to increase the number of appointments that we have during the day and also to be able to schedule out more than just a week. Currently, we schedule our passport appointments out one week in advance. Um, and so it does make it very, very hard to get an appointment because you have to be ready to go Monday morning for the following week. Um, and if so, if you're trying to plan in advance around children's um, days off, that kind of a thing, um, it makes it difficult. But given the, the level of staff that we have, um, if we have someone who's absent unexpectedly or illnesses unexpectedly, if we, we found that if we schedule out more than a week in advance, we end up having to call people potentially and say, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to fulfill your passport appointment because we just have such limited resources. Well, I do like the idea of um, scheduling out more than a week in advance, and I think that that would help um, solve the kind of planning issue for a lot of people who are trying to get here for appointments. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that given the benefit that we would see as a city and our, our residents and people in surrounding communities would see in accessing more opportunities for passport times, I mean, it, it did remind me of kind of the summer camp lottery, or not lottery, the summer camp registration system where I was like Monday morning I was ready to go, you know. And so, um, and given that the revenue is around 50000 so then um, the cost would really be around twenty. I mean, I think that it is – it seems like the benefit that we would provide uh, would be it would be worth the cost, the in, the additional investment. Councilmember Coulter, thank you, Mayor. Um, so the the question I have then, so this um, and Christine, you you said earlier it was how many more appointments approximately per week would would this position the, would this change allow for? This would allow for approximately 35 more position or excuse me, appointments per week, council member. Okay. That's what I, that's what I thought you said. I just wanted to make sure. Um, and now that, that 50,000, is that, is that assuming all of those 35 new appointments are filled or is that just sort of a, a projection based on, on kind of demand? Council member Coulter, that 50,000 is a projection based on our current, um, um, 
rate of accepted passport applications per week. We typically always fill our appointments, um, but we do have occasions where our customers um, do not show up or are not prepared or they schedule an appointment when it's really a renewal and so an appointment isn't necessary. And so that, that 50,000 is based on um, our current rate of, of, of having folks actually successfully complete their passport appointment and provide us with the $35 reimbursement or fee that we charge um, for accepting that passport application. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful to know. And you actually already answered my second question, which is, I mean, do we, essentially, do we think we could fill up these appointments if if this new if these changes were made? And it, I mean, it sounds like appointments are already full, filled up as it currently stands. So it, it it seems. I mean, do you, do we think that is the case? That if we have these thirty five more slots per week, that we're gonna we're gonna fill them up pretty similarly. Mayor and Council Member um, Coulter, I don't see us having an issue filling up those passport appointments. Um, it's one of our most frequent phone calls is how do I get an appointment and when can I get an appointment and did they already fill up this week? Um, there also aren't very many other passport acceptance facilities near us and so um, we're kind of one of the only shops in town if you're looking to apply for a passport. Sure. Thank you. Council Member Loman. So just one one question. It, it was kind of intriguing that uh, that Councilmember Carter had asked about the uh, passport piece. Is that so? I'm noticing here as I look at the um, the post office uh, that's kind of located next to the airport that that's that closes down at 11 p.m. Uh, is there is there some reason why that, that uh, we can't send our stuff later by getting it over there, or is there something restriction in terms of it's got to be sent through Bloomington? Hope you understand uh, Mayor, that. Council Member, <laughs> Council Member Loman, uh, currently we are using the, the mail service provided by the city of Bloomington. Um, this proposal does not take into account the additional cost we would have for um, either having a staff member bring late night passport mail to the to the airport, um, either you know having it couriered or having it um, having it delivered there. Um, so that would probably increase some of our staff costs to try and do that and would decrease then the amount of passport appointments we could do if we were trying to open it up in the evenings. Um, it's certainly, if it's something the mayor and the council are interested in, it's something we, we could look at, of course. No, just more so, we uh, just wanted to understand what, what that restriction, what was stopping it from going later on in the, in the evening, whether or not it be. Uh, so if if we could get it to the airport, theoretically, we could expand those evening hours. And that would just... just a curiosity that I had and maybe another council member had. So council member Nelson. Yep. Thank you, mayor. I was curious about that as well and appreciate the answer. And, you know, I think if people are interested in it, it's something we can look at for future budgets. Um, a, a couple of quick questions on this one. Um, Ms. Scipione just mentioned that there aren't many other places to get passports. What is the closest other location to get a passport and you know, how, how many of them, might be in reasonable proximity to Bloomington? Um, mayor and um, a council member, um, I don't have them all memorized off the top of my head. We typically send folks down to Apple Valley um, because there, um, there's a Dakota County service down there that does not require appointments. Um, and so typically that's where our customers that we can't serve, we recommend they go um, because they've they've already tried other passport acceptance facilities. There's one in Richfield. Um, and so and that, that also requires appointments. And so that's typically where our kind of overflow, if you will, heads is down to Apple Valley. Okay. Um, and am I right in, this, in understanding that adding these additional hours there's a net cost of about twenty thousand dollars. So, am I right in understanding that we're already having a net cost to the city of providing this service? It's not covering the cost of doing it. Uh, Mayor and um, Council Member Nelson, there are other things that these um, positions do in addition to the uh, passport acceptance agents. So, this is also our licensing staff. 
that provide um, service to all of our licensed applicants via um, the, you know, the mail or the phone or um, that come in and stop to our counters. So it's processing all of the um, alcohol, tobacco, massage therapy. Um, we work closely with environmental health to take in all of the applications for rental licensing, um, for our um, our food and beverage upper, um, licensing. Um, we process the contractor licenses um, and work closely with building inspections. So there are other pieces that the licensing specialists do in addition to the passport acceptance. Um, I don't have a breakdown of exactly how much would be passport and how much would be licensing. It's certainly something we could estimate if the council is interested in, in seeing um, a rough estimate. All of those get paid out of our licensing budget, both of those functions. So it's a little hard to break down, um, but we could provide an estimate if it's, if it's helpful to the mayor and council. Um, I'll be honest. I don't know that I need that. I just, I noted that, you know, we did, uh, um, close the DMV because there were other locations provided by the count, county nearby and obviously passports are a federal item not a city item generally but it, it seems like the staff is being utilized in other areas and um, so the cost is probably not that significant uh, um, cost not not like we're looking at in those other areas so just wanted to check so thank you thank you council member is there anything else council very good. Uh, Mr. Mayor, just last slide, I just want to just really quickly mention that we did, there was a request for an additional human resources uh, staff person um, that was not funded in the, in the budget, but I just wanted to give you a sense of scale in terms of uh, hiring. Uh, in 2021, there were 86 staff members hired. We are currently at 137 full and part-time, uh, which is, you know, roughly a fifth of the workforce. And so as we look at year two, year three, year four, with nearly a 50% turnover in staff sort of anticipated in that maybe four or five year time frame, uh, training and development is gonna be a significant item and you'll hear me talk about repeatedly in future years. And with that, I'll stand for questions. Very good. Council, anything additional? Council Member Delisandra. Yes, Council Member yeah, Delisandra. Thank you. Um, uh, Assistant City Manager, I'm curious about that. Um, you know, um, I think I think um, we've talked about this kind of on a department by department basis, but you mentioned that um, there have been a, a 137 recruitments this year. Is that right? Successful hires from recruitment. Is that correct? Yeah, Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, that's correct. Okay. Uh, how many of those were um, attrition versus new positions? Do you know? Uh, I'm going to look at the city manager. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council members, almost all of those are uh, are turnover uh, recruitments. We've had, oh, make me do math off the top of my head here. Um, the new positions that we had, uh, we had ones that were budgeted. So at the beginning of the year, uh, we had, Kari's pulling the numbers together, uh, I think we had eight, eight new staff in the 22 budget, mm -hmm. and then we had f um, six additional during the course of the year, four firefighters, uh, the Office of Racial Equity and Inclusion, and, uh, actually seven, two compliance positions. Uh, and recall that the, the um, racial equity position and the two compliance-related positions uh, we carried in the Strategic Priorities Fund this year, knowing that we would be hiring them uh, mid-year. So we mm -hmm. had, yeah. So we had the new positions that were authorized last year. So what is that? Sixteen, if I'm doing the math off the top of my head, fifteen, sixteen mm -hmm. that were new. Of the hundred and thirty-seven, give or take. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I, I am. Uh, this is not related to the budget explicitly, although. I guess to some degree it is. If we have to hire additional HR staff because attrition is is bad or high, maybe is a better word than bad, um, uh, then what are we doing about lowering the attrition rate? Um, it just would be another you know normal question, and I'm just curious if there's any thought on that front from an HR perspective. Um, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Alessandro, a couple of things. So, so what, number one, we are trying to do. Um, 
integrated sort of stay interviews with employees to make sure that they're uh, having the tools and the resources they have to be successful. We're making some pretty significant investments in training and development, both not only in sort of on the racial equity front, but also just project management, um, performance management trainings, things that can do some um, enhancements so they can grow professionally. The other thing that we've done that we've brought in an outside consultant to provide some direct one-on-one coaching for people who ask for it. So that's a resource that we haven't had available. Now we have two folks that are dedicated to to be able to do coaching and mentoring um, in real time. Ideally, that would be a function of existing HR staff, um, but they just don't have the capacity to invest in the development of the departments. But that's something we want to build and grow into because we know that our leaders of tomorrow are going to have to have a different set of skills. And so growing that talent pool making sure that they're committed to, uh, to the city of Bloomington and also we're investing in them. It's, we feel is going to save us long-term um, through reducing some of that attrition. The other thing I'll just mention is that we are going to bring on 18 full-time firefighters and potentially six more full-time firefighters year over year over year until we get to some number north of 60 or 70. And so those new recruitments, those new staffing plans, that new uh, fire department model is going to also require a lot of attention and resources from HR staff. I agree with all of that. I, I, I think it's important, you know, for people to know that it, you know, this is not maybe hard and fast, but from an HR perspective, generally speaking, it costs 11 times more to hire a new person than it does to retain an old one uh, or an existing one. And so, you know, making sure that we're focused on retention strategies there um, is actually a, a budget conscious item. And so, you know, I want us to be thinking about that. It sounds like you are. So that's, that's good for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Anything else, council? Thank you. Thank you. All right. It's just me now. <laughs> just me now. Uh, I will point out we're, we're to item 2.3 now, our, our budget discussion, our 2023 budget and tax levy discussion. I will point out it is now 10 minutes after 9. We're three hours and 10 minutes in, two hours left before our 11 o'clock deadline. Uh, just pointing it out to both staff and to council as we as we continue to move forward here, let's keep an eye on the clock and make sure that we uh, we don't extend this longer than it needs to. Thank you, Mayor. I'll try to zip through these quickly. Um, all right, so just a recap of our budget process to date. Um, first, it was, whoops, um, there was a focus on the new strategic priorities plan. Um, so we wanted to align the budget with the new strategic plan. And just as a recap of what has happened to this date, May was the citywide budget kickoff, um, as I said, aligned with a new strategic plan. June is when departments entered their budget requests into our um, UNIS ERP financial software. In July, the departments had individual budget meetings with the city manager, assistant city manager, CFO, and me. Um, and then in May, um, I'm sorry, or from May to October, we've had monthly public engagement events. And so I've talked about in the past, rather than having uh, just a budget event here at the city or a virtual event that we tried last year, which we had very low attendance, instead I went out into the community on evenings and weekends uh, monthly and had a budget table set up and gave out budget information and got feedback uh, for the residents, had a budget game. Um, that they could uh, use coins that represented property taxes to show uh, visually what their priorities were. Um, And then, of course, August 22nd, we had a a similar budget meeting like this um, when when you were getting ready to approve the preliminary tax levy. And then that 2023 preliminary tax levy and budget was approved on September 12th, a 10.5% increase from 2022. And then um, the last couple months, uh, we've had, as we just finished up here, these in-depth department budget presentations, giving you more detail and taking a deeper dive into the budgets. Um, and just uh, to reiterate that this 2023 budget has been a significant investment in police and fire. Um, and that, as you know, that um, as Fire Chief Yuli Seal has said, the... I, 
ideal number of firefighters would be 155 and it's only at 97. And the preliminary budget that was approved had six additional new full-time firefighters. Um, the police department has 123 officers uh, authorized. They did have a request for six additional police officers um, when they give their presentation. Um, Chief Hodges uh, explained the need for that. Um, the preliminary budget for 2023 included two new police officers. It also included a new dispatch training coordinator for the for dispatch, which um, has had a lot of issues with a retention. Um, and um, so there was a need uh, to support that as well. And we talked about this before too. This is just a recap that a 10.5% tax levy increase, um, the, the preliminary budget, that equated to $11.49 per month increase to the median value home. Um, and that $7.52 of that amount is an investment in police and fire with the positions, also um, the increased cost with the body cameras, um, axon fees, and some other police equipment and fire equipment. Um, also, the increase in debt service for a fire station uh, number four that's in there. So, go back one slide. Um, just talk, just to, to look at what our tax levy increases. Um, we've said before, ten and a half percent increase is much higher than we've ever had that I've, I'm aware of. Um, as far as an increase year to year, and since 2016, it's more between four and five percent on average. In the last two years, we've been very specific, um, very intentional about trying to keep the tax levy as low as possible at a 2.75 percent increase. These are the preliminary 2023 tax levy increases to some comparable cities within the metro. You can see. Um, they are all on average higher than they are and have been in past years. Um, there's Bloomington at 10.5%. There are ones that are higher than us and ones that are lower as well. But even the lowest one there at 4.19% is a lot higher than, um, you know, but typically when we're looking at um, tax levy increases on, from year to year. And on average, all of these together are 8.72% increase. And then on Friday, the Minnesota Department of Revenue had a news release. And um, sorry, I keep getting ahead. It goes back. It's slowly coming back. OK. Um, Minnesota Department of Revenue released this on Friday. And so I, I added the slide. Um, for cities in Minnesota, they took the overall levies of all of the cities for the preliminary levy and compared that to the 2022 levy. And in total, that was a 9.1% increase for cities. So I just have that highlighted there as a comparison for Bloomington. And you can see the counties, townships, schools, um, not as high, but um, those are all there as well. And then this is, this is 2022. Um, but just showing median value home, the monthly property tax per median value home, um, Bloomington compared to other uh, comparable cities at $101 per month. And then I just wanted to quickly talk about, um, I already talked about this a little bit, about what we did differently for public engagement um, around the budget and the community. So um, in all, it was 367 people. I have the different events listed there and the amount of people. Um, so I've already shared kind of details um, back in August uh, when we had this uh, budget meeting. And at that time, we had gone all the way to August 12th with the On The One Music Festival. And I'd gone through and read um, all of the de the feedback that we had and presented that um, I do have all that detailed feedback 
um, in the agenda packet that's public. Um, also included our responses from the farmer's market and from the fire department open house where we had a lot of people stop by. I also had, um, I think it was five um, residents that either emailed or called and I have their detailed feedback as well for your um, information that's there. But I didn't want to read through all that this evening. Um, and then again, uh, this was a new thing that we did this year, uh, was this budget game where we had different categories um, just to align with um, different areas of spending and strategic priorities. And um, we, we uh, got this idea from the city of Duluth. They do something very similar. And I learned this at a conference so that um, in July, um, the conference is in June. And so in July, I, we started trying this out here. And um, just want to make the point, I think um, I think some residents have you know, said this is not a, a, a huge amount of people um, that have stopped by. And it's, I just want to make the point, this is not a statistically accurate survey in any way. It's more of an engagement, um, kind of education on what city property, city property taxes are spent on. Um, and just kind of get them a sense of different events we're at where we're seeing you know, where people are using their coins that represent property taxes and how they're allocating those. And I highlighted like in each event, you can see like the top two and it changed at, at different events that we were at. Um, we do do, as you know, the National Citizen Survey that is a statistically, I know, um, scientific survey where we get feedback. Um, but having these op additional opportunities for me to gauge with the public, along with the town hall meetings that you're all having, um, are just you know more ways to get out into the community um, and engage with people that might not otherwise um, do a survey or come to the city to um, let us know what their priorities are. Um, and just um, letting us know what their priorities are for spending city resources and then an opportunity for us to share information on you know, things that the city provides, services that we provide, projects that we're working on. Okay. So as a review, the base budget um, that we put together had a increase from the 2022 tax levy of 7.76%. And so... Right, can I interrupt for just a yes, second? Yes, yes, yes. Council Member D'Alessandro, did I see your hand up? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, oh, Mr. Yes. Mayor. Um, I, I just, before we moved on to the next part of the conversation, I just wanted to personally thank you, Kari, for doing what you did. That's a, above and beyond the call of duty in the sense that uh, not, I don't know that there's many city buddy, budget managers who are out there on nights and weekends talking to fellow members of their community um, and doing so much work to try to be available to uh, community members, you know, across the city. Uh, so just personal thank you for that. Um, I, I really do appreciate it. I think it makes a difference. And um, I commend you for, you know, taking a lot of your personal time over and above uh, what your, you know, day job is, if you will, um, to do that. I know you live in Bloomington, so it's it's good for you to hear this stuff too. Uh, but even if you didn't, um, you know, it, 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 it means a lot to the people of Bloomington. And I've heard several people come to me saying it was really great that you were there. So thank you. Thank you. Well said, Council Member. Thank you. So what I mean by the base budget is that um, just starting off, it was the existing positions, but then there were, um, as we talked about a little earlier, some new positions added during this year that um, we had talked about, like the um, additional equity and inclusion specialist, the legal compliance manager, legal compliance paralegal, and then the four firefighters slash fire inspectors have were added. So that was included in the base budget, but there was no additional staffing requests on top of that or increases in discretionary spending, no increase um, debt service and no base. Um, it, it was just base salary. I'm, I'm sorry. There, there was a debt service increase because um, we have to make sure we have enough property taxes to pay our debt. And then there was also the base salary adjustments. So that's what um, was driving the 7.76%. And just a highlight of then positions we added on to that, there were, there were more requests than this, but these were the ones that um, came in, that stayed into the 2023 budget request that was approved for the preliminary. There were six uh, new firefighters, 
two new police officers of those six that were requested, the dispatch coordinator and trainer, um, one human resources representative, one sustainability specialist that would work with Emma Struss, and then one additional park keeper that would help with a focus on natural resources. And so this is what was approved for the 2023 preliminary. And so adding those additional staffing positions I just went over, and then also increasing supplies and materials um, that have increased due to inflation, increasing increases for those part-time seasonal wages to compete with the current job market. Um, initially, that all of that was an increase of over 11%. And then um, in order to bring the tax levy down to 10.5%, we increased the amount of um, money, which we called st tax stabilization, that's transferred from the Strategic Priorities Fund. And that was planned um, like starting in uh, during the pandemic to kind of offset our decline in lodging and emission taxes. So we had that planned at $1.1 million, and we bumped that up to $1.83 million um, for the pre preliminary general fund. And that was, as we said, it was kind of a, like a placeholder because we thought there could be some other things, but we didn't know where, like we might have additional revenues or um, cost savings other places. So that was the, this is the um, preliminary. And so on the on left side column, you've got the 2022 tax levy in those different categories, the biggest part being the general fund. But we also, have, as we kind of went through, we've got some for communications. We do bring some into the solid waste fund for uh, forestry and removal of diseased trees. There's an amount for the fire pension, the aquatics fund, the art center, golf, ice garden. Uh, in 2022, we did have an amount to um, in the tax levy for strategic priorities fund. And then um, we have the amount for a construction in the tax abatement area. And then, of course, the debt service amount. And so um, you can see in 2023 the amounts um, that we have in all those different categories. And then in total, it's an increase of $7.2 million. That's a 10.5% increase to the levy. If you're looking at that impact to the median value home, um, or what that amount is for a median value home, it's $112.50 a month. And since this is getting just very big up in that upper left-hand corner, if you took that for um, a monthly increase, uh, that is $11.49 a month. And so just breaking that out, um, just to be very clear, so at a 10.5% increase, um, the impact to the median value home is, uh, normally we look at it per month or per year, but it's $2.65 per week, $11.49 per month, or $137.90 per year. And then this, just um, another way to look at this, the, the preliminary 2023, the proposed 2023 tax statements were just recently uh, mailed, so um, probably everyone has received theirs. And um, just to highlight that when receive that property tax statement. It's not just the city that's on the property tax statement. It's the city, county, school property um, tax as well and other property tax um, taxing entities. And so this would be for a median value home. Um, so you can see um, at $355,900 is the median value home for 2023 and what the amount for the city property tax would be and then the overall. Any questions about any of that before I go into um, some options for 2023? Questions so far? Okay. I see none. Okay, so since the preliminary 2023 tax levy was set in September, um, we've had some uh, very positive developments that have happened. So we received, we got news that we received the SAFER grant. Um, this, and that stands for the Staffing for Adequate Fire and Emergency Response. So that's going to pay for 18 full-time firefighters for three years. As I said earlier this evening, seems like a long time ago, we, um, 
We had uh, our forecast for lodging and admission taxes has improved to $308,000. The permit revenue analysis has increased by $836,000. And um, something we haven't talked about yet is uh, with the new credit card policy that was recently approved, we're able to reduce our um, credit card fees for bu building and inspections down 75000 So now I'm going to get into um, some different options just to show you different things that the council could consider and how that would affect the tax levy increase. And then I have a chart at the end that kind of shows it all together. So there's seven different options here. I'll just kind of talk you through each one of these and then have the chart in total. Um, so this first option here would reduce... So all of these would be... Um, a reduction down. So instead of a 10.5% increase for the tax levy, this would be a 9.63% increase. And so to get to that 9.63%, um, we, would, we would be able to add two additional police officers. So instead of two, there would be four um, in the 2023 budget. However, in, um, so we do have the 18 firefighters that we are um, will have full-time firefighters from the safer grant um, there's as chief seal said when he did his presentation there's still definitely a need for those six but um, in this option we would not have them start until july so you would have a half year of savings and then also um, in this option we would reduce the amount of the money coming from strategic priorities into the general fund back to the originally planned $1.1 million instead of kind of that $1.8 million placeholder. So that's option one. Um, option two, it's a lower tax levy increase at 8.54%. And the first two are the same as what I just said with the two having four police officers and having the six firefighters starting midway through the year, but we would keep the amount from strategic priorities fund at 1.8 million. So that's why it's a, not as much of a property tax levy increase. The next one, oh, I went too fast. Okay, 9.24%. We would decrease the expenses in the budget. Um, so it, again, we would have the firefighters start midway through the year, but we would bring it back down to uh, 1.1 million. So that goes back up 9.24%. Um, this one is we would just we would only have 18 firefighters, so we wouldn't we wouldn't bring those six in at all that are currently there. And we'd basically um, use that savings to uh, reduce down the strategic priorities um, back down to 1.1 million. And um, doing that, and then it also all of these scenarios are also incorporating in the additional permit revenues and lodging and emission tax revenues. So that's how it's able to bring that down. Um, Another option could be to not make any changes at all, just take keep it exactly how it was for the preliminary budget that was approved and just reduce it down to 8.7% by using the additional lodging and emission tax revenue and permit revenue and um, are the main drivers there. Um, or this one would be 8.16% increase uh, from 2022 having the firefighters start halfway through the year, but keeping it at 1.8 million from strategic priorities. Um, and then this last one, this is the lowest one, 7.62% is um, only having the 18 firefighters, not, um, not adding an additional six, and then also keeping the amount at 1.8 million. So as you can see, I think as I'm running through these, we could do lots of different <laughs> scenarios, but here's seven kind of to start conversation and see where the council would like to be. And here's a chart with all of them. So I will just 
kind of explain what I've got on this chart. It was the, the seven options I just went through. The, the top one that says prelim, that is based on the old revenues as far as the, you know, the lower lodging mission tax and the lower permit revenue. So um, that's kind of a, not quite the same when you're comparing. So that's just showing it where we started, but that's a, has different variables in there. But options one through seven there. So I've got excess checked if we're going to take strategic parties amount back down. Um, that's checked. Or if we're going to um, have firefighters still have the six firefighters but wait till July to bring them on board. If we're going to have the two additional police officers or not. Or if we want to have an option or if you want to have an option that there wouldn't be any additional firefighters. We just have the 18 that are coming with the safer. So you can see the different tax levy increases and then what that impact is to a median value home for a weekly, monthly, and annual impact. I think, is that my last slide? So I, yeah, so my last slide is, I, I can come back to this one, but wanting to get a sense of where the council wants the final tax levy increase to be and what options you're interested in to get there. One of those options are a combination or something else entirely. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Thank you, Kari, for the very comprehensive walkthrough and the numerous options to choose from. Uh, I just want to plant my flag in the ground here on a couple of items as the council starts their conversation. Uh, I feel relatively strongly about the strategic priorities and, and not continuing to have the $1.8 million uh, uh, levy stabilization at that amount. I, that That's a number that is getting uncomfortable for us from a staff position in terms of the amount of that structural imbalance, uh, especially combined with the fact that um, the you know the revenues that we're forecasting uh, I think are reasonable and we have to receive those revenues to make sure that we balance every year so I, I heard a comment earlier about the conservative revenue estimates and I think uh, that, that I don't think that that's the word I would use for our current budget I think that we have reasonable revenue projections uh, especially in the area of building permits uh, in the the issue there uh, is really one about what's trying to forecast what's going to happen in the market. And uh, I think it's pretty evident that the combination of interest rates uh, and inflationary pressures is having a significant dampening effect on single-family residential construction. I also included information in your one weekly on Friday that um, the strength in uh, multifamily um, development projects continues to be there despite the interest rates, is there still a market for that, especially as people are moving away from single family? We're not doing any new single family residential in Bloomington and haven't for a long time. We're gonna continue to see, I think, pretty strong development in the multifamily sector. And based on what we have in pipeline, I'm pretty confident that our commercial um, sector will uh, continue to perform as well. So we're comfortable with what's forecasted in the building permits. Um, but we're getting a little, getting a little anxious because we can't see into the crystal ball, right? So that's that's the first thing I wanted to point out, and the second uh, is just to talk about the firefighters a little bit, and and maybe Chief Seal is the better one to talk about if you're wondering how the staffing model works. Um, I think the chief will tell you that 24 works better than 18, um, given the number of stations that we have. Um, that that would be the preference, um, and trying to balance competing pro, um, budget priorities and, and sensitivity for uh, you know maintaining the tax levy increase at, at as low an amount as possible um, but the you know the the transition to the the hybrid um, staffing model is going to take us a, a 10 years right to get fully there um, so you know, making a good down payment on it next year would be good, and it would help in the efficiency of the model to have 24 rather than 18. So those are the, the two that I particularly wanted to point out, and then I, we're all available to answer questions as we go. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. 
Thank you, Curry. Appreciate it. So, Council, it's good to have options. We have options. Councilmember Coulter, then Councilmember Loman. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my, I guess my first question, and I don't know if this is best best answered by the city manager or the fire chief, um, but my my first question is, you know, I get sort of from the the staffing model and the the down payment on the transition to the um, full time fire department. I get why twenty four is better than eighteen in that regard. My question is in terms of cost is in, and how that factors into that transition, does that, does that make a significant difference? Would it, would it be sort of penny wise and pound foolish to go to, to, to only bring on the 18 instead of the 24? Does that make a, a significant difference from, from that respect? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, it's not very often that you stump me, Council Member Coulter. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. No. I think you know we're, like I said, we're looking at a ten-year transition here. Um, I I don't know that uh, there's any way to avoid uh, some of that uh, financial impact. It's it's a pay me now or pay me later kind of thing, right? Yeah, and, that, and, and so I guess my question is, if it's pay me now or pay me later, there it sounds like your answer is there, as best you can sort of formulate, there's probably not a huge distinction in terms of what the cost difference would be. No, I don't. I don't. I think if I were to fall down on one side of cost versus um, model efficiency, I would probably fall down on the side of model efficiency. Okay. I don't know if it's necessary, Chief. If you want to come up and just talk about the twenty-four versus the eighteen, real quickly doing really good <laughs> and and let me b before you start chief I'll, I'll also ask the question related to this given what we just heard about our human resources department are we going to be able to hire 24 firefighters in a year's time ah uh, i'm not sure which one to take first I'll, i guess i'll take that one first um, um admin and hr specifically has been working and faith have been working with us uh, to build up to this. Um, the eight, the difference between 18 and 24 won't be significant because we'll build a list. Um, that list will be good for a year. Um, so that that really won't be much of an effect, the, the difference. Uh, the, it's a big chunk anyway at 18, and I think that's the stressor. The additional six won't be any anything much more different from that because we'll have already done most of the legwork to get to the 18. I forget what the first one was. Oh, 24 versus 18. Yeah. So um, to um, the city manager's point, um, the staffing issue and changing to a hybrid issue, um, there is a significant impact as you bring people on. All right. And um, um, the difference between 18 and 24 is six people, which um, basically would add two per shift um, so we'd have um, eight people working each shift rather than six people working each shift which gives us better coverage gives us more people on trucks um, there's no way to, to minimize the, the the fact that we're struggling staffing wise and there's no way to fix that in a hurry as as you guys know um, so any little bit will help um, but for the fact that we got the safer grant, I would have been grateful for six. So I want to be a little cautious here. Um, but, um, you know, 24 is better than 18. It builds efficiencies quicker. And I think just to uh, somebody, I can't remember who made the point here, but um, when the 18 come onto the general fund in 26, we'll have already done some of the front work for six a year in between now and then. And it will actually make the impact um, lighter, I think, than trying to add 18 plus 6, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of spreading out our impact that we're trying to build up um, our staffing model and get to that hybrid model. I hope that answered your question, Mr. Mayor and Council. Council Member Colton, you okay? Yep. Council Member Loman. 
Uh, thanks. So um, when I look at this, I, according to my math, and be careful with that, uh, if we look at that, um, you know, at the 10 and a half, it looked like we had about a 65% uh, of uh, both police and fire. So if we're talking about this being a public safety um, uh, uh, budget that we're proposing and what we're asking folks, um, and so my question, my first question about this is, did that include the safer money with that? I think we had it something like we had $11.49 or $11 and then $7.52 of that made up was, uh, was uh, uh, police and fire. I, I'm assuming that did not include the safer money locked on top of that. It was just... Yes, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lumen, that did not include, include any money for the safer grant. And so, um, and then um, you know, my, my colleague here uh, has made some points in terms of, uh, um, Councilmember Nelson has made the, the, the statements about with regards to, um, you know, basically if we look back over several years, we've had a lot of uh, positive budget uh, variants. Um, so we've been very good at, at hitting those numbers. And I do understand that there is, um, you know, there's some concern about, about hitting those numbers. But you know, I think we've got a real long track record of, um, other than the pandemic, uh, of, of of really hitting those numbers, you know, year after year, and so um, I think we've got to think about that in terms of uh, those folks that are are that are going to be facing, you know, inflation. You know, we've got a lot of layoffs that are happening. Uh, there's a projected uh, downturn going into next year. So I, I really do uh, think that uh, what Councilmember Nelson is putting forward is, is something we really need to think about as we, uh, as, we, as, we, as we walk forward into this. Um, the next, my next question is, in terms of uh, do we have a fund um, or someplace to place money <laughs> So that we are building and having ourselves prepared for when we get to those years when that when the safer grant ends, is there a amount of money that we're going to be putting aside uh, for that? Um, kind of like what we did with the fire pension piece, Mr. Verbrugge. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, Council Member Loman, the Strategic Priorities Fund has been identified as carrying out tax levy stabilization. You'll recall coming out of. Uh, coming out of the COVID budgeting that we had that in there initially for an, an, another two to three years. Um, but recognizing that we have this transition with the staffing with the safer grant, we've uh, pulled that stabilization number out into uh, 25 so that we can start to make that transition. Okay. So is that part of the reason why you want to kind of pull that number back is. is to kind of hold it for that? It is. I, mean, I think that, that makes a lot more sense to me in terms of that. So just trying to understand why we're trying to do that. So then what I would say um, is that uh, just from my perspective, uh, with all, all being said, um, I would like us to kind of focus on that that public safety um, uh, and police. So I, I'd like to see that, that six uh, firefighters, and I'd also like to see the six uh, police uh, included in, in, in that number. I don't know what that number looks like by, by trying to do that, um, but I think that, you know, we talk about this being a public safety. Uh, I think that the, uh, both chiefs have made um, compelling cases for what they're trying to do, and we're, we're telling the public that we want to, you know, have a public safety uh, piece here, and I think we need to try to, uh, try to do that if we can um, and try to provide that at, at a, as most reasonable rate as possible with the most uh, likable or the most likely um, uh, chances that we're going to get to those numbers. So that, that'd be that. That's my uh, point of view. Mr. Berbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Lohman, so you'd be looking at option one or two based on what I understood you to say. Um, so option one would uh, be 9.6%. Uh, and that would be leaving the um, strategic priorities uh, levy stabilization amount at 1.8. Uh, I'm sorry, the other way around. That would be reducing it from 1.8 to 1.1. 1 .1. uh, if you were to go with option two at 8.5%, that would be the six firefighters and the two additional police officers, um, but it would leave the strategic priorities stabilization amount at 1.8. I don't think my option is here. Because I, I thought I said, well, you six, said six. You said six, six police, police officers. officers. Okay, yeah. So that's a clarification then that we would have to 
um, do a little bit of recalculation, and we can certainly do that. And the other piece that I'd like you to work on is because uh, I think that Councilmember Nelson really has something there, uh, you know, in terms of the, you know, because each year I, I, you know, we come back, we ask for a, you know, for a certain, um, you know, levy, and then there's this budget, you know, this budget uh, positive performance. Um, and I, I think that that would, you know, as a as a taxpayer, that might get me a little upset because you know you're you're now charging me more than what I have. And so I think in this particular case, I think we can try to try to see if we can narrow that field by you know looking at at, at being a little less conservative, uh, as it were, with some of those. those. I mean, I'm not asking to completely. You know, we've we've won some of those awards out there, <laughs> so I, I can understand why you want to stick to that, and I appreciate that. But I think, given the circumstances that we find find ourselves in, you know, we've had so many years of where we've been on the opposite side of that that ledger of two point seven five, two point seven five. We've really tried to keep those numbers low, but I think we really have identified a public safety need uh, within our our community. Uh, I know the mayor has been championing that and, and really pushing towards that, and so I, I think we really need to need to look at trying to do that if we want to accomplish these things. Sure. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, uh, I think it is important to um, remember that the positive budget variance every year isn't just a function of, um, reserve, or of revenues being greater than what we have forecasted. Every year we're required to uh, levy for a contingency that is 2.5% of our operating budget. And so that's Two million dollars, Kari. Yes. Right, and so the contingency fund we're required to do that's going to create, you know, so that two million dollars. If we stick to our the rest of our budget, you're going to have positive budget variance just because of the contingency. Um, we also budget for an estimated unspent. So, um, as as much as our um, directors. Um, uh, appreciate the, all of that is allocated for their operations. Um, we also expect that there's going to be money that doesn't get spent, and a lot of that comes in staffing. What we have is frictional vacancies, but we're already accounting for that in our budget because we already calculated an amount that we're expecting for estimated unspent. So the you know in most years, the positive budget variance uh, is pretty close to what the contingency amount is um, and a little bit of extra because... Um, the revenues come in a little bit more than we forecast. And that's good because we don't want to get aggressive on the revenues and then have them fall short. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to ask a couple of clarifying questions here. Uh, and and I, I do think that um, this year's po positive budget variance or if however you want to call it surplus, whatever. Um, I mean, I know that that had a lot to do with the specific pandemic grants we were given too. Wasn't that true, city manager? Yep. Yeah. The, I mean, so we th the, those weren't a function of our forecast or our or our budget. That was a forecast of us being given help because the pandemic was. It was a lot ridiculous. of federal money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and then we can't count on that going forward. Obviously. Um, okay. So a uh, quick question for you. Um, what is the what is the number of firefighters we when when the safer grant runs out? What is the number of firefighters we wanted to have added to the budget at the end of it? So we have eighteen. We, we're front loading eighteen because we have the safer grant, so we can do eighteen instead of the six 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 that we talked about, right? What's the number at the end at at in twenty twenty six that we were trying to get to? Chief Zeal. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, that 18 was not ever intentional to be at a replacement for 666. If you want to know an end number of what we want to get to for um, um, full-time firefighters, it's about 75. Um, so this is a multi-year plan that we've been planning for some time um, to try to fix the staffing deficiency. In addition, we would still maintain 60 part-time or paid-on-call firefighters to get us into that uh, 120 firefighter range. Yes, understood. So, so if that's a 10-year plan, and let's say that 10-year plan kicked off 
I don't know when you guys consider it being kicked off, but let's say it was a 10 year plan to get to 135, 75 full time, 60 paid on call. Um, this this 18 that the safer grant grant supports and that we have to come up with the money for come 2026 is 18 of that 75 correct yes okay there's a the, the what i'm trying to understand is if our goal is to get to 75 by year 10 assuming we start year 10 in I don't know, this year, next year, last year, I'm not sure. But assuming we start there, that's an average hire of 7.5 firefighters per year for 10 years. If we are doing 18 now, we are two years ahead of schedule of seven and a half a year for 10 years. Is that the way we're thinking about it? Or I'm, I'm just trying to understand like what what our strategic plan is to get to that 75 number and 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 how we can move the move the needle when we need to to continue the pace that we want to get to but but potentially um adjust accordingly based on the 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 the, the needs that we have so so in other words if, if i want to put two additional police officers in here and i say if i do that and i don't do the six firefighters additional to the 18 am i hurting our chances of getting to that 10-year plan because I don't have to hire the ten, the two firefight or the two police officers again next year, but I still have to hire firefighters next year. So I know that you're going to come back, and we're going to add another percent to the levy next year just for those firefighters. And so I'm just I'm trying to play with those numbers there a little bit, and, and I don't know if you can provide me any guidance, um, but I also don't want to take us off our our ten year plan of getting to seventy five for sure. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember D'Alessandro. Um... I'm sorry to complicate things. Sir. No, you didn't complicate it. I, I'll try to bring some clarity to it, and I'm not positive I can do that. Um, the 10-year plan um, was an effort um, for me to bring something back to council when we started talking about this as a way to get to a number. Um, it wasn't necessarily an optimal plan. Um, you are correct. Um, if you do strict math, you are correct. Um, uh, seven and a half a year. I'm not sure how I'd do a half, but the 18, the 18 was jump starting it. If you think about it, the 18 plus 60 at six a year over 10 years gets you close to the 75 um, or 78 um, career. Um, so um, I will tell you that the plan is nothing more than what I brought to council, and that can be adjusted. And it can be adjusted any way that the council um, would like to, including saying that, oh, okay, we're not going to um, hire um, six that year, we're gonna hire 12 the year after that, or anything along that, along that measure. Um, 10 years, I think, is a long time to look out um, for anybody right now. Um, if we just look at the last four, um, I don't think any of us would have planned um, what happened in the last four. Um, it was something to get us started. So that, um, that plan, that 10-year plan, is certainly done in um, pencil, and I've got a big eraser. So we can make changes to that plan as um, both um, the city and um, the council um, think is appropriate. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, um, so um, the yeah, I, I, I feel like so here's where I'm sitting at the moment just to kind of be comf give. what I'm looking for is a combination here um, that's um, maybe not on this board. It maybe it is on this board, but ideally, I think um, something under 9% would be great. And it, it's good to see that there are five options on the table here that are that are in that four options, one, two, one, two, three, four, five, five options on the table here that are in that range. So I feel like I feel like I there's some places to work. So now I'm in the now I'm in the process of things like what if we reduced the I'm making this up, but what if we reduce the strategic priorities transfer to 1.1? We didn't we didn't add the six firefighters. We only added two firefighters and they started in July. And we added the police officers. Am I still under nine? 
like those are the kinds of things I'm starting to think about. And and I don't know if we could we could do that math. And so it would be over the 18. You still get two more. That's not the six that we're looking at, but it's still adding more. Plus, we get the the police officers, which we know we need. Plus, we you know get the rent, the, the stabilization back. So I'm, I'm wondering if that's an option and if that falls somewhere between it, it to me feels like that would maybe fall somewhere under that 9.63. Maybe it sits around that 8.54 number. I don't know. But if, if we could look at something like that, I, I would be interested. Um, I do agree that, you know, we want to keep investing in this, these public safety needs. And so I, I don't want to be shy about doing that investment. But I, you know, I also agree with the stabilization comments that, you know, that's just kicking a can down the road that that we can't commit to fixing in the same way that we can commit to fixing it with, you know, c commit to fixing or adding the firefighters we know we need um, in whatever configuration we can over the next five, eight, ten years, whatever the right number is there. So I don't know if that's helpful or not, or um, but I maybe we could do something like that. Well, Mr. Thanks. Mayor, Council Member DeSandro, I know you don't want me to do the math, so nope. I'm going to let no, Kari, no, that's okay. I'm that's let okay. Kari take care of that. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks. Yes, Mr. Mayor and City Manager, if, if we could, I don't know if that's a, a, a fairly yeah, easy configuration to to offer up. Um, so it's basically number two, but sorry, it's number one, except it's two firefighters to start in July instead of six. And I just don't know what that number is. So I... Uh, I appreciate your comments, Council Member, and yeah, Chief. Thank this you is for. Thought. Yep, exactly. So, and and Council Member Loman's comments as well. But what what I don't want to do is math on the fly. I mean, I'm not good with math anyway. But to do math on the fly is, I think, not a good idea. So, what if uh, is, is it possible for the seven of us tonight to come up with a number, a levy amount that we're a levy number that we're comfortable with? And then the priorities around it, whether it's reducing the, the the strategic priorities transfer, whether it's adding firefighters, that kind of thing. If we could do that and then turn it back over to staff to try and figure out exactly how we get there, I think we might be in a better position than trying to do a la carte all night. Because I think we could be, we could sit here and try and plug in different scenarios to try and make this all work. So uh, I, I would ask, I, I mean, I heard Council Member D'Alessandro say she likes below nine nine percent i heard council member Loman add four more police officers up to six cops so it's uh i mean wh wh where are we comfortable doing all this council member martin yeah uh yeah thank you Mayor. just uh, very briefly um i don't the conversations uh, we've heard in the community at the events i've heard from uh neighbors community members folks understand we need to go through a foundational shift in the way we approach fire safety services in town, infrastructure-wise, staffing-wise. Um, and I appreciate the, the comments about kind of smoothing cost burden for residents, but at some point we got to pay the piper on this. Um, so I, I, I'm in favor of doing uh, option one, um, but my priority is, is staffing, getting folks out there both in the fire department and police department, because if we don't pay for it today, we're going to pay for it next year, the year after. And so I say just go for it now. So you're going with with a set option already. You're not, you're not option one for Councilmember Martin. Very good, Councilmember Nelson. What are you thinking? I'm thinking Councilmember Martin's making it way too easy on you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, did you bring a slide rule with you, Councilmember Nelson? <laughs> I just have 17 different options. I'd like to review. No, I'm totally kidding. I I want uh, I support the firefighters. Um, I support the police officers. I could probably support two additional police officers. Um, I, I see those needs. Those are things that people hear from us. I'd like more information on strategic priorities. Um, what our fund balance is currently what we typically put into that fund in a given year if it is going to be you know if we think if we hit the numbers would be at 2.5 i also think there are a few things just within other areas like the golf course 160,000 uh that we could uh defer paint essentially paying ourselves back on that um with low impact there and we'd still be near our working capital goal maybe a little bit of a look on the lodging taxes there's some things I heard about with the strategic plan for communications, which honestly, I've been one of the people that has talked about our communications and improving that capacity. I just don't, 
it, when I look at these priorities with police and fire and the impact that this is going to have on people, I'm not sure that that's a priority in my mind right now. Um, some of those things that I think we could do internally versus bringing paying people to do them, uh, a number of those items, you know, I don't know what that number gets to. I'm not going to suggest that we do any type of math on that, but I'm just saying in general, um, the firefighters, the police officers I support, I'm open-minded on strategic priorities. I just want to know where that leaves us and what that does in the out years. Um, and then uh, the one other area, and uh, this is maybe my bad because I don't totally understand it, but admin went up like 13%, um, and I think that one deserves a little bit more scrutiny. Scrutiny, You know, 13% increase in one of the area's budgets. Um, see more than any of the other ones, and I, I didn't fully understand uh, the need for that. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Council Member. Additional? No, we don't need to go down. That that, that would be too predictable of us. Come on, <laughs> Council Member Coulter. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, you all know I don't like to pick arbitrary numbers when it comes to to levies because I I think I I prefer to sort of talk about priorities first, and I guess. Where, where I'm at, I mean, you know, as I said earlier, I, I get it from sort of the, the perspective of transitioning to the full-time model and, and better outcomes and efficiencies and so on with our, with our fire department. I get that side of it. I'm, I'm, it's still not clear. I mean, it, it sounds like the answer is that there's not really a significant cost difference between the 18 and the 24. And in in the long run, and so that that being said, I I it, to me it doesn't necessarily seem like a priority to get twenty four coming into next year. I I to me it seems like eighteen is a good enough down payment on that transition. Um, the I mean the the two additional police officers I I I mean I don't feel very strongly about the the firefighter thing, but I I'm just I'm I'm not there. It, it doesn't feel to me like that's a significant enough difference to really warrant that that change right now. Um, the two additional police officers, I I mean, I think to to Councilmember Lowman's point, if this is a if we're going to call this a public safety budget, and given that it's been what 13, 14, 15 years since we've raised the authorized police force, that would to me be the higher priority. Um, I am likewise concerned about the the strategic priorities fund. I, I think, I mean, if that is, as the city manager explained, that's sort of where we're building up the financial capacity for when that safer grant expires. Um, that's something I do think we need to look at. Um, so those sort of trying, attempting to sort of assemble all of that together, um, I would say for me, I, I think a good target would be somewhere in the nine percent range, um, ideally below that. If you were, if you were to be frank, if you were asking me to pick one of these options, if that, and I know that's not what we're doing, if we were picking one of these options as where how we would proceed forward, the closest, frankly, to my thinking would probably be option four, um, just in terms of you know getting at where I I think. Um, what we really need to be doing and what I've been hearing from folks um, in terms of the, the impact of the levy and inflation and all of that. So that's just kind of where my thoughts are. Um, you know, that being said, I'm, I'm nothing, I, there's nothing that I'm like, you know, going to bang my shoe on the desk about. <laughs> so um, I, I mean, I, I, I honestly don't disagree really with most of, with almost any of the thoughts that have been expressed tonight. That's just kind of where, um, I personally would like to see things go. Councilmember Carter. I do not. So no mic and mask and yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as I look at kind of what's before us, my preference would be that we get to um, below nine. I also agree with reducing the strategic priorities transfer um, and the structural imbalance there and everything we've talked about. So um, 
I think that I'm probably leaning closer to one with the exception that I do want us below 9%. And so then maybe it is a combination of um, some of the ideas that Council Member Nelson has brought up in terms of looking for cost savings in other places or addition, maybe increasing our revenue projections a little bit. Um, and then also potentially what Council Member D'Alessandro was talking about in terms of instead of having six firefighters, maybe we have three or four or even five just to be able to get us um, to reduce that number. And it sounds like from Chief Seal that there might be some opportunity there to do some modeling um, and kind of figure out uh, what a long-term plan is. I mean, is we, I know we have a plan in place, a 10-year plan, but you know, what are the options there in terms of staffing up the fire department? Um, obviously, <clears throat> know and understand the, the, the real needs that we have in terms of public safety in the city, so absolutely I'm supportive, uh, but I really, really would like to see us below 9%. Thank you, Council Member. I mean, I I would I, I would agree. I think below nine percent. If we're just throwing a, a dart and without saying exactly where, I think below nine percent makes sense. Uh, I would say that uh, to some of the comments about yes, this is a public safety budget. Without making any changes right now, it's a public safety budget. Adding two police officers, adding the firefighters, making that commitment to a full time fire fighting staff, it already is a, a, a public safety budget. If we add additional things on there, it's even better. But uh, I'm going to argue that it already is, and I don't think by not doing some of these things, that doesn't take away from the fact that we've made this commitment to, to public safety um, in in, uh, in Bloomington. Uh, I do think it's important um, to reduce that that strategic priorities transfer. I think just that that structural imbalance is just it makes me a little hinky as well to carry that out too far and um, to look for to look for ways to make that up in the future. I think we we have the opportunity to make up a portion of that now, and I think it makes more sense to do it now than to, to try and plan for that in the future. So, uh, I, I mean, I would I would aim for that to reduce the, the um, strategic priorities transfer. I would be open to uh, additional personnel, but I'm not uh, necessarily going to say that we need those additional personnel to really solidify the fact that this is a, a public safety budget. And I, I think uh, I would agree with Councilmember Coulter. I, I'm probably leaning closer to number four uh, in that, yeah, 24 is better than 18, but 18 is better than six. And and we're, we're moving in the right direction there. And it, uh, it provides us with uh, the, the number that we'd be aiming for and also would reduce that strategic priorities transfer. Those are my thoughts. Councilmember Lohman. So I want to throw another curveball here. Um, <clears throat> so I know that uh, we've got till the end of the year, but uh, uh, the markets haven't looked good. So um, when we look at our uh, our fire pension piece, you know we're gonna probably take a hit there. You know it won't impact us, you know right away, but that's gonna um, hit us. So that's part of my motivation in terms of wanting to kind of front load some of this uh, stuff now. Uh, as we get into some of those out years, we, we may have to take a step back. So I don't know how many years uh, down we'll be, uh, but uh, I just you know want to make sure. And I mentioned that earlier in the process when we talked about that. Uh, I don't want anybody to forget about that, uh, but there could be an impact. So um, I, I understand it. we're trying to get this in, in under, and I, I totally totally support that. Um, but that's that's just part of what I'm thinking. Uh, Mr. Verrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Lohman, uh, you and I share a similar concern. In fact, the CFO just shared with me today where that number is right now. It's a bad number. Uh, and what you mentioned earlier about us having established a fire pension reserve fund uh, six years ago uh, is going to uh, neutralize a lot of that impact for night. So, and again, that is a number that gets certified at the end of 2022 that we will levy in 2024. So that's a that's a 24 tax levy impact, but it looks like our reserve fund should be able to cover that impact for 24, even with a bad number. Yeah, and I'm not too concerned about just that piece. We've got that covered, but if it's multiple years, that's yeah. where it gets Absolutely. a little more exciting. And that is also... Yep. Uh, if we we look at that, that's you know 
one year shy of when then we'd have all these other uh, uh, and seemingly we would look to next year add you know more and then you know now now you've got these new folks coming in and then you take a, a, an additional hit so you know, certainly we're set up to to, to try to uh, uh, to, to ha- take one year of down down but uh, what if it's like it did before it was multiple years of down not just the one year so uh, th- that's why I'm concerned there may be a reason you can argue the other way <laughs> but uh, um, to be even more cautious about it but if, if, if our goal is to get to that uh, to that that out number uh, um, I, I think we ought to look at trying to add uh, those additional uh, those additional firefighters um, and if we can get them in this year I think it's a good time I just think it's going to be cheaper to get those six additional you know, given what we know about the economy, given what we know about staff shortages, uh, you know, those dollars are going to be cheaper today than what I would think they're going to be, you know, a couple of years from now. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, to your point about the public safety, and maybe the city manager can remind me, but um, even before this discussion, what a significant portion of this levy is already public safety, correct? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, <clears throat> the answer is yes. And so with the numbers that have been moving around in the last few weeks, it's a little bit harder to specify exactly what that percent is because we've had a fair amount of um, uh, additional revenue, which offset the, you know, that offsets the property tax levy piece, right? But just uh, to recap what Kari started with, the starting number for the 23 tax levy increase was 7.76%. And included in that was the new debt service for fire station number four, four firefighters that were added in 2022 that'll be uh, in, built into the levy already. Um, and then uh, significant increases in both police and fire um, equipment and training and supplies and whatnot. So even before we started our budgeting this year, there was a significant public safety component already in the base. Uh, And then the addition of the two police officers and the dispatch supervisor um, on top of that uh, is additional. We had the six firefighters, and we'll determine what's going to happen with the six firefighters. And I'm sure for people who are sitting at home and watching this and trying to uh, make... (laughs) make sense of the slides here. Um, Just real quickly, we had six in the budget. We received a federal grant after we started our budgeting process that will pay for 18. And so the discussion here is whether we continue to move forward with the six that would be covered by the general tax levy that aren't covered by the federal grant. So yes, there's a significant amount of public safety investment already in the budget. And if I recall correctly, when we past the 10.5 preliminary levy, um, that number was somewhere around 6.9% of the levy. Increase was for public safety between the police and the fire department. Is that at all close to the recollection? I believe it was higher than that. I think it was closer to eight. Yes. All right. Yep. Um, Part of the reason I bring this up. Just to restate that so everybody understands, of the the levy increase amount. Yep. About eight percent of that amount was related public safety. to yes. public safety. Right. And the reason I bring that up is we saw comparable cities, and you know, some of them were you know nine point six in Edina, and some of them were at four point five and wherever. Um, are we aware that any other cities are are sort of facing this transformational cost that Bloomington is is doing? Um, yeah, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Nelson, Chief Seal can probably speak to this with more detail. Um, many other cities have already made that shift, um, and they're smaller departments than ours. So uh, a couple of them, you know, bit a good amount of the apple already. Um, so uh, Egan, Brooklyn Park uh, are two that jump to mind uh, that in the last couple of years have done that. Um, so this is, you know, this Bloomington is not an outlier. I'd say what makes Bloomington an outlier is that for a community this large and a department this large that we've held on as long as we have to the duty crew model. 
that makes us an anomaly. And the, the difference here is that we're providing a phase transition uh, as opposed to a pretty sudden transition. And a lot of that is because we recognize the, that we have to manage an impact to the taxpayer. Yeah. Okay. And, that, and that's what I was trying to get. I mean, it seems to me, and I know I've harped on, you know, different budgets and, and do think there's some areas of savings in different areas. But, you know, the reality is, is I think our budget is actually not out of line with neighboring communities and being driven by some extraordinary factors that that we have talked about for years that we need to face and i think you know councilmember martin said it you know we need to do this you know it's you know we're just kicking the can down the road and so we need to do it and um you know i i think people from my conversations with people they get they get it they get police fire we need to support that we need to make sure that they're there when we need them so um yeah, mm -hmm. That's all I got, really. So I, I know I said we weren't doing math on the fly, and you don't want me doing math on the fly, but our, <laughs> but the finance people did some math on the fly. <laughs> and let me just throw this at you as a possibility based on the things we've heard, based on what I've talked about here. So option four plus two additional police officers would be about 9.1%. We get as close to the nine. We could ask staff to continue to sharpen their pencils and... Um, you know, perhaps some of the things we brought up this evening as possibilities. Um, it would certainly be, I mean, it would, it would fulfill some of the things we're talking about with the, the additional officers and with the strategic priorities transfer. Um, thoughts on that? Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. I liked your suggestion of giving direction to staff and letting them come back to how they could meet it as well. Maybe they have a different idea about getting there. Um, but I, I mean, I think that's, that's good to know that that's mm -hmm. going direction. I, I, you know, I still support the firefighters, but, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, if there's a way to do it, I think, I don't know, the city manager can answer the question better than, than I can. If, if they feel they have the information they need from the council, to come back with some recommendations. And, and I do want to be careful to, to frame it in that way. We're, we are building six fire stations over the course of 10 years. So we're supporting the firefighters. Yeah. And, <laughs> but I do, this transformation to this hybrid model is something we've talked about for years. It's something that we need to do. We've seen the data yep. on response times and the number of uh, trucks running short staff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, it, it, we just had, in, in my mind, the, the quicker, the sooner we can get there without it being completely financially unreasonable, you know, and I think the reality is, is, you know, we're going to have tough conversations or those that are here are going to have tough conversations in three years mm -hmm. um, when, you know, we have to start to absorb all these costs into the budget and mm -hmm. uh, we don't have the tax stability from, you know, all of the COVID dollars that we've been able to put aside to help us with the uh, budget stabilization. And, um, you know, th this is going to be a, a big issue. And, it, it is. it, you know, one of the things that we look at, we're, we're very cost competitive on the median value of a house. There might be a reason. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there might be a reason why. Yes. You know, and that may shift. And, you know, but we need to prepare the community for that. We need to prepare our uh future councils and leaders and everybody for that and uh no, no sense in waiting to do that so councilmember d'alessandro thank you mr mayor um yeah I, I appreciate you all doing the fast math there uh very much so um you know we're in range i would say the, the only other idea i have for potentially you know giving recommendation back to staff it, and we kind of alluded to it a little bit earlier tonight there are there are a number of uh, number of the budget department budgets that we've looked at where they're where they're um, um, their um, reserve dollars um, are above a hundred percent consistently for a period of for a long period of time, and so the the question might be is there a way to sh like shave some of that off right? Not that we want to get everybody to drop to eighty percent. Nobody's trying to do that. But is it, can you go from 110, 104, 108, 112 down to 98, 99, 101, or whatever? And does that yield us places where we have 
dollars then to transfer into some of these strategic priorities. So that was just, an, as we talk about sharpening pencils, I wanted to make note of the fact that several of the the spreadsheets that we've seen going out into you know, 25, 26, those numbers where they are green and they're staying green, do we have opportunity there? Thanks. Thank you. So with the idea of a general direction, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, Council members, or staff, <laughs> I, I am confident saying that I have uh, I have general direction. <laughs> I do not have specific direction, but I'm I'm comfortable with that. So, um, and and uh, council, if we're comfortable with that, I mean, we've talked. I'll, about a I'll lot restate of it. I'm I'm going to shoot for something in the low nines, and then we can tweak around the edge. I've heard most everybody say they would like to be under nine, and we'll do what we can to get there, um, and still try to meet some of these um, different uh, perspectives on how we want to get that done. Is everyone comfortable with that for where we are tonight? Okay. I'm not seeing any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Mr. Mayor, if I could, just to set an expectation yes. both for the council and for people who are watching at home, um, the, the next time we're planning to have a budget conversation is going to be on December 5th when we do the, um, the public hearing around the budget um, and <clears throat> keep in mind that when people are coming in to testify, most of them will have not sat through this discussion. Um, so they'll be reacting to the 11.49 or 10.5, the 10.5% 10 is what they received in the mail. Um, and then we will ask you later that night to adopt a budget. So we will provide some information to you in advance about um, our recommendations for how we can get there. Uh, but keep in mind, you also do have open the possibility of deferring action until the 19th of December. I'd rather not do that because that gets to be a pretty frantic um, exercise for our finance staff to get all of the documentation ready and submitted to the county um, to certify. So we're going to try our best to get it done on December 5th. Everybody cool with that? The delegate from Virginia, you're okay with that? <laughs> Very good. All right, then. Our last item tonight, item 2.4, uh, city manager, council update. Anything, Mr. Verbrugge? No, sir. I have not. A, anybody else? Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just real quick clarification for anybody uh, watching or staff especially got confused with my questions about... Uh, pooling franchise fees. Multiple communities pooling franchise fees totally exist. Southwest Community Television is one. They're called cable commissions. So to quote one of my favorite shows, Mad Men, I thought of that. Turned out it already existed, but I arrived at it independently. So <laughs> doing pretty good. Duly noted, Councilmember. <laughs> Councilmember D'Alessandro. Yeah, Mayor, just wanted to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to serve the community, and I'm grateful for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Travel safe, and uh, as you make your way around and eventually back here, travel safe. Councilmember Nelson. Do we meet the Monday after Thanksgiving? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, yes, we do have a regular scheduled meeting next Monday, okay. and uh, the mayor and I are both absent from that meeting. Council Member Lohman will uh, be presiding. Mr. Sable will be sitting in this chair. So, <laughs> Council, hearing nothing else, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to adjourn. Roll call. Nope, roll call. <laughs> oh. Mr. Brillert, we have a motion and a second. Uh, would you please call the roll? Councilmember Coulter. Aye. Carter? Aye. Lohman? Aye. Nelson? Aye. Martin? Aye. Councilmember D'Alessandro? Aye. And Mayor Bussey? Aye. Motion carries 7 0. We are adjourned. Thanks, Council. Good discussion tonight. Very good discussion. And thanks to the staff for the in depth uh, presentations. Greatly appreciate it. Have a good night.